All right, guys, it's Saturday morning. Uh, welcome to this webinar. And we've brought the webinars back because we do enjoy doing these, but obviously we've done a couple this week on an evening slot, eight o'clock, but uh, we want to do some in the daytime as well. We're going to try an 8 a.m. slot. Um, we appreciate there's a lot to get done with the rest of the day, so we're going to try our best. And I'm going to make sure that, you know, seeing if a couple of people are in here that like class questions, make sure we keep this nice and short. Um, but let's crack on. So, what I wanted to do is just talk about electricity wet regulations today. And the reason I'm bringing this up is let's, let's just go back to when we were at training or at college, you know, you go through your syllabus and you're a young learner and you want to learn how to do the job. You want to learn how to do the things that you do at work, but you know, in the college, in the train, they'll go through legislations and they very often get given this, um, this identity of being, uh, just a package of waffle that goes in with other health and safety stuff. And from that point on, we don't really revisit the electricity work regulations. We move on to do obviously, you know, testing, we move on to do design work, but we don't revisit the legislation perspective or even dig back into them. I, I, I train a lot of guys who haven't <coughs> even, um, don't even understand that you can access this for free. So what I wanted to do today was just, briefly skip through this document and try to reference how useful it would be to use this information in the field. Uh, more importantly, for things like if you're going to do an EICR. Now, if you do an EICR, for us, we spend so much time and effort trying to learn regulations, trying to learn to work safely, and we want to put all that on the paper for the client, but the client doesn't really want to know all the non-conformities with BS7671 regulation, this regulation, that. They fundamentally want to know that they're safe and that they can carry on working. That's most often the point of the EICRs is to achieve their legislative obligations. So if we can try as much as we can to relate and even reference the information from an EICR to the specific legislations that those non-conformities actually result in, that gives the kind of much, much firmer understanding on the, the essential aspect of getting this work remedied. And it helps the client. Uh, you got anything else to add to that, Bob? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, relating to training, uh, apprenticeships and stuff like that. Uh, I know when I taught in an FE college, it was commonly regarded by the lecturers as the boring bit we do at the beginning. Yeah. And we'll, we'll crash through it as quick as possible um, to get it over and done with because nobody wants to do it because it's as boring as hell. So boring um, as hell, yeah. Yeah. And the, th the interesting thing about that is that when you look at every City and Guilds course um, that we've done subsequently, it always starts off with health and safety. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's, it's it's part of every course we do um so and, and again it's one of those things where people oh God, let's, let's patch this out let's get this through oh we don't really need to cover this because we've done all this before and it's boring it's easy and mm -hmm. um and it's often quite, uh, treated with contempt yeah. and then some of the issues that we were discussing or we have been discussing over the last few months especially to do with inspection and testing mm -hmm. eicrs you know when guys are sort of scratching their heads thinking well, is this right? Isn't this right? What do I do with this? Does it conform or doesn't conform? We've got to look wider than the regs. And quite often, when we look at the electricity at work regulations or the Health and Safety at Work Act, they actually provide the answer to how we should be uh, coding yeah, and treating a electrical installation. It's beyond what's in the regs, because sometimes, mm -hmm. quite often, the regs is a bit... Um, confusing anyway shall we say yeah. wouldn't it be great but, if if we did an eicr and on the schedule of tests we could also add with the codes a reference to a legislation that also results in non-compliance yeah you know yeah. just so that we can join those dots and what we've got to remember time. is that we've got to remember that the health and safety at work act and the electricity at work regulations are law hmm. yeah the regs is guidance is a code of practice yeah which it does so say. if anything they actually are more important yeah so, so yeah there's a lot of guys right now who are obviously going to be stressing and struggling to try to maintain value, you know, because we're going to have a lot of people pushing down the price of EICRs, undervaluing EICRs. The race to the bottom. Yeah. And I think if we can really enhance our understanding of electricity at work regulations, health and safety at work act, management of health and safety at work regulations, oh God, um, pure and all these other things. And if we can identify non-conformities with those on our EICRs, and we can also 
offer that information to the client, that's going to make the client, if you know, if the client gives a crap, uh, find much more value and also, you know, much more uh, action on what yeah. you find. So, yeah, I mean, you, you can highlight the fact that, um, especially these businesses are sort of doing so many people doing like 10, sort of 12 EICRs a day and sort of spending sort of like an hour on it. Um, it just does not comply when you look at the the uh, legislation with the HS, uh, Health and Safety at Work and the Electricity at Work regulations, there is no way that uh, EICRs done to that sort of standard comply. Mm. Yeah. It's crazy. So, I mean, yeah, Dennis we just we said can the, use them to raise standards. That's yeah. the thing. Dennis just said in the chat, we didn't go into the Electricity at Work regs at all, other than the fact it was statutory. Yeah. You know, so if we're out there in the field, if we're aware of this statutory instrument and we can then use that to inform our clients, our clients are, you know, are going to find a lot more value from that. So to start off with, if you haven't obviously got access to the information we're going to go to today, then it's very simple. You either go to this link here, you know, just Google EAWR and you can go straight to the legislation site. Yeah, you can search Let's at Work Regs and you can just download, you hit this button here, PDF, you can download the actual instrument. Yeah, which I've got here, which you can even provides it's you know it's it's just free this is you know this is free access and you can provide that or you can have that on the site or you can have it on your tablet so you can show the client about the instrument itself um adding to that obviously we have the the great document which is hsr 25 and i created a presentation which was oh regulation one regulation two regulation three um but really we should just go through this book so this is obviously produced by the HSC, but it has additional guidance for each of the regulations, which helps offer us an opinion on how it's interpreted and also you know, how the health and safety inspectorate would actually investigate and look into this. This again, just if you haven't got it, just Google HSR 25, you'll find a link to it on the HSC site. You can purchase it, so, so you can have a hard copy of it. <coughs> this, you know, so I have, it, I have it over here so I can hand it to people, or you can download it digitally as well. Um, so do get a hold of this. So it does say on the site, so the guidance is issued by the health and safety executive. Firing this is not compulsory. It's guidance, isn't it? So guidance is never compulsory as we know, just like BS 7671. Okay. You are free to take other action. The, the, the question is, you know, if you take other action, how do you then justify the other actions? How do you, you know, guarantee that they are, no less safe okay if you follow the guidance in hsr 25 so that's the guidance on complying with the legislation okay both are free to access and you should have them all right you're doing enough to comply with the law mostly okay they you'll be done a very 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 small crack if you were to follow compliance and still uh, follow the guidance and still actually uh, end up with an issue Health and safety inspectors will seek to secure compliance with the law and they will refer to that document. That is, this guidance bit is the very first thing mentioned in the book, um, pretty much as you turn the first page at the bottom. In fact, I can actually just go like this, this, you can see this. And it's there. Guidance. First thing mentioned. Okay, instructs us that the health and safety inspectors may seek to secure compliance with the law and they may refer to this guide. So use it. Yeah, but I mean, just to clarify that, yes, yeah. the guidance HSR 25 isn't statutory. Mm -mm. However, the electricity at work and the health and safety at work is. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the next bit in this is who should read the book? Do you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to have this open. This is easier. There we go. So there's a contents here about all this and we're going to go, briefly go through each of these regulations. Okay. And the more you understand these regulations, the more you can relate them to BS 7671 to your EICRs. You know, you've got poor connections, you go straight to 12, uh, sorry, straight to 10. You've got issues with your earthing or your identification or your installation. It's all in here and you can very yeah. easily find that some of your normal codes might result in non-conformities with the literacy at work regulations. Yeah, that gives you much better information for you to give to your clients. There's a just a comment there from Sean talking about the fact they use the word systems rather than the word installations. Or, um, 
two things about that is that we were talking about 7909 the other day, which is temporary electrical systems. Mm -hmm. right? And they refer to uh, the electrical uh, equipment and systems that we put together for temporary events as a system rather than an installation. Because in their definition, an installation is something that is put in permanently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Whereas for temporary electrical events, you know, but then we put in systems because they come out again. They're not a permanent installation. So it the does. word systems will cover installations and systems, whether they're permanent or temporary. Also, the word systems covers, if you look at the guidance in the uh, electricity work regulations, it covers the fixed installation that we put in plus any equipment which is attached to it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It okay, does, we've it, got to we've got to be sort of um, conscious of that, and we've got to make sure that we've uh, applied that so that we're aware of the equipment that's being uh, installed. And this is quite important when we come to things like selecting what type of RCD. Indeed, because we should be aware of what equipment, hopefully, well, to the best of our ability, what equipment is going to be actually connected to the electrical system, so we select the correct type of RCD. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit mentioning a BS 767, which we'll see in a minute, which actually also mentions temporary systems as well. So systems is uh, a very good point to understand. Um, we're going to go through these regulations up to 16. 17 to 28 are obviously ref uh, with regards to mines, which is... Uh, this used to be fully uh, covered for that, but there was a new legislation, I think it was 2012 or 14 ish that came in for mines. So this is kind of taking a back step for that. And so we'll, we'll just jump from there to the defense. And um, you'll, you'll see people say defense a lot, uh, the likes of uh, Paul Meenan and similar, who I can see is in chat. Um, they're referring to that specific regulation, and that's the one that you should always be um, you know, referring to to cover yourself. So. <coughs> <coughs> let's get to the bit here okay so about the book who it's you know who it's for um there's additional guidance for mines in electrical safety mines which is another area altogether so this bit's interesting so someone's banging next door all right so the made under the health and safety work act so this is why you may see often that there's that large umbrella illustration with the health and safety work act on it and then all the other fine legislations underneath okay this obviously is dated from 1989, implemented in 1990, which it mentions there. Okay, so you will see through this book, uh, it will say the regulations, yeah? the regulations. And you need to try to remember that if you see the regulations, it's specifically talking about this document, okay? All right, so do remember that. And uh, let me just change my screen share to this one Boop. and we'll bring this over here just in case my brother wants to keep talking to me <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> right tell him you're doing a webinar and you go mm -hmm. so yeah God bless. so we're going to start seeing these uh we mentioned systems sean's already mentioned systems here okay can you hear that beeping no. Uh, I'm just going to shut Discord down in a minute. <coughs> All right. So the Health and Safety Work Act applies principally to employers as self-employed and to employees. So who else is there? Who else is there? You've got trainees in some cases. You've got employees. You've got self-employed. You've got employers. So basically everyone but the public themselves, really. Would you agree? Yeah. yeah. So... We'll see for each case as to how it applies to employees, employers, in respect of systems, equipment, and conductors. These are bold because they're mentioned in the definitions, okay, which is uh, the second part. This is about a uh, previous edition. So 17 to 28, which apply to mines, were wrote, oh, 2015, okay, because the 2014 mine regulations came through. So it's, it's basically just sup, uh, supporting it very gently now. So we're going to skip past those. So who should read this? Uh, and I want to highlight this, and that's kind of um, why I had a slide for it. So we have duty holders mentioned. It's primarily for duty holders, including those involved in the design construction. And here's a key word. What does this word mean? That means anybody who uses an electrical system. 
or electrical equipment. So it's not just designers, constructors, inspectors, managers, it's people at work operating the system. Okay. It could be engineers, technicians, and their managers. So again, we understand there are different hierarchies of levels of authorization and control, but fundamentally anyone who is a duty holder who operates the system, this book is for them. And we're going to see that employees are duty holders for their area. Okay. Okay, so let's go through here. Scope. All systems and equipment, whether manufactured, purchased, installed, or taken into use, even if it's manufacturer installation, predates the regulations. Remember, that there means predates 1989. So you can work in a system. I was working in a, in a system just this week with switchgear from 30, 40 years ago. Okay. If equipment predates these, it does not itself mean that the continued use of this equipment is a contravention. Yeah, so you may go to an installation that predates 1989. Doesn't mean the use of that predates these regulations. For example, some of the equipment to which the regulations apply may have been to a standard such as a British standard, which has since been modified or superseded. Standards such as 767 can provide assistance, but ultimately compliance with the regulations is required. Remember, we're seeing 7671 here, but it means when it says the regulations, it means the electricity at work regulations. Yeah, which Phil has already said, 7671 is just guidance, just a code of practice, but this is a statutory instrument. So regulations compliance is required. It's likely to be reasonably practicable, we'll come to that term in a minute, to replace it with equipment made to a more recent standard when either, and but only when, it becomes unsafe. So maybe it's become unsafe due to um, damage or a state of, you know, beyond uh, beyond repair or it falls due for replacement for other safety reasons so maybe there is a, another purpose okay whichever occurs sooner so you don't have to immediately replace equipment that predates 1989 to apply these regulations but if you're going to start selecting equipment you should make sure it complies with standards that do come under more modern standards which we know we need to do because BS 7671 will tell us that so can I can I just throw a, a spanner in the works there so how yeah. about RCDs there then Type about... AC RCDs, yeah. which now, because of the advent of more modern technology and um, electronics in electrical equipment, um, mm -hmm. type AC RCDs are becoming useless. And yet, there's there's other RCDs which are available. So <clears throat> you could look at that and say, well, that means we've actually got to start looking at replacing mm -hmm. type AC RCDs if we know that the equipment being supplied by that circuit has BC feedback, electronics, and all sorts yeah. of other things. Yeah. The, the problem is that last bit you said there, if we know about the equipment, and that's the thing that we're, short, that we're falling short on right now, isn't it? Yeah. if we know it, about we, the equipment, it'll knowledge. be much easier to select an RCD, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah. We need to start being aware of the, of the equipment that's installed. I mean, things like a washing machine, it's not like somebody's going to put a washing machine in one day and then take it away with them. You know, when yeah. it's in, it's in, isn't it? So if it's a washing machine, which we know, uh, yeah. We will actually negate the effects of an AC RCD. Then we need to start thinking about installing the proper RCD for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I agree with that. <coughs> right. So this is mentioned on seven six seven one. Okay, and do remember, you know, seven six seven one is just low voltage electrical installations. So this this these regulations, the electricity at work regs, apply to all systems. Um, but there's a heavy mention of 7671 here, but don't think that only 7671 is enough. All right, so it mentions here, also known as REX, it's non-statutory. It relates principally to the design, selection, erection, installation, uh, inspection, testing of installations. Yeah. Whether permanent or temporary. So that brings us back to this systems discussion we've just had. Yeah. So temporary systems or permanent in and about buildings generally and to agricultural, horticultural, etc. Code of practice widely used and accepted in the UK to comply with these, okay, widely used. We know that, it says that in the beginning of 7671, doesn't it? The Health and Safety Executive has their little paragraph that tells us, oh, we, we identify this as being a great way of achieving compliance with the electricity at work regulations. This is a bit of a handshake, really, between the two. There are, however, many types of system equipment and hazards to which the 7671 is not applicable. Mines, quarries, vehicles, public electricity, explosion, but, you know, you know it. So, 767 also only applies to voltages up to the uh, upper limit of LV. 
So that's just a little mention there that going to 7671 alone is most likely not going to be sufficient. Then adds this little bit here. Installations to which 761 is relevant may have been installed in accordance with an earlier edition of 7671, now superseded by the current one, uh, or but then current. That in itself would not mean that non-compliance with these regulations have been met. So if you go, oh, you know, you've got an installation to 16th edition that doesn't comply with the electricity at work regulations, uh, this, this paragraph here says not necessarily. Okay, so we, we, we need to understand what the requirements of the regulations are. There's this other paragraph here on the ESQCR, which just tells us about, you know, suppliers of distribution equipment and temporary supply networks. <coughs> it's just another, another authority, really, for ESQCR matters, although the HSC does perform some functions on the Department of Energy and Climate Change's behalf. Okay, so that's if you're involved in the distributing of electrical systems, then you need to also go to those areas there. All right, do you want to say anything before I start going through the regulations themselves? No, you're fine, go on. Cool, cool, cool. All right, so regulation one just tells us how to identify this standard or this, uh, this legislation. So it's cited as the Electricity Work Regulations 1989. It came into force on the 1st of April 1990. We've said a few times lately that we think that there, uh, there might be a need for an update. Do you think we need to do some updates to this or do you think it's still strong? What do you think? It's a, well, when you consider, I think also, yeah, when you consider it's 1989, okay, it's been sort of looked at since, but um, yeah, I think with the current sort of, well, I say current, but with the years and years of sort of uh, in, increased and changed and altered technology, I think there might, be, I think there's a good reason for perhaps revisiting this and and, and redo and rejigging it hmm. and i think also well, yeah you know more and more and more i'm actually referring back to this rather than the regs for, for quite a lot of the installations that i test and inspect hmm. i'm referring back to this rather than the regs because the regs can be quite um challenging should we say in their interpretation whereas yeah. <clears throat> this is actually to me it clarifies things a lot more you know is it safe isn't it safe? Okay, well, it's not safe according to this, so I'm going to do something about it. Mm. Okay, um, just looking at the chat, a couple of guys are saying uh, the NIC, etc., they require you to have a copy of this. Yep, but you know, um, I know a lot of people will have a copy of this, but they'll have a copy for the purpose of that NIC assessment. And a lot of people will have a copy and actually not read the blooming thing. But um, ah. a lot of people do have a copy, but they just don't read it. I've got a copy of the Bible, I haven't read it. <laughs> Um, mentioned here about uh, RCDs. So regarding RCDs, this is, this is Daniel. Regulation for any equipment provided under these regulations for the purpose of protection of persons at work on or near equipment shall be suitable for use, which is provided we maintain the condition suitable for that use and will be properly used. Uh, yeah, we're going to come to that regulation. So he's yeah. suggesting that regulation for four, about the suitability of equipment, uh, would be a regulation that might be just, you know, one that questions ACRCDs. Well, it would have justified a replacement of them. So we'll highlight yeah. that when we get to it, yeah. Good point, Daniel. Okay, so uh, regulation two is interpretations. So this is obviously just identifying different terms. Um, we don't really need to ha spend too much time on these, really. Um, it basically just gets us to identify these. Remember, this, this isn't really just for electricians, is it? This is for employers, this is for employees, and so, you know, this whilst mostly uh, you know, electricians will refer to this book because uh, they're the only ones who really are told to, this is written for everybody to understand. So we've got terms such as circuit conductors, conductors in the system, okay? These are intended to carry current in normal conditions or to be energized in normal conditions and includes a combined neutral and earth conductor. It does not include conductors provide solely to perform the protective function by connection to earth or other reference point. Okay, but again, uh, if that, I, I would argue that if that conductor used as an earth or reference point is carrying current due to operating characteristics, then you would probably escalate that as a conductor to a point. Conductor means a conductor of electrical energy. Danger means risk of injury. Let's jump to injury then. Injury means death or personal injury from electric shock, electric burn, <laughs> explosion and arcing. Very similar to the fundamental principles that we see in BS7671. Okay, and we're going to remember that when we think about what's reasonably practicable. 
okay you'll see reasonably practicable equipment this is a um, key it includes anything used intended to be used or installed for use to generate provide transmit transform rectify convert conduct distribute control store measure or use electrical energy um, I go back to that regulation a lot of times when I look at the IET code of practice for um, inspection and testing of electrical equipment because as it's defined there anything that uses electrical energy needs to have some level of maintenance so I always come back to electricity work regulations when I try to determine what these different definitions are system okay so we had the little discussion this system in which all the equipment is or may be electrically connected to a common source of electrical energy and includes such source and such equipment and that's as phil said the difference the equipment is included instead of a fixed installation the equipment is added to this to make it a complete system if you will yeah i mean the odd the odd one there is the word conductor isn't it conductor if you go back to yeah if you think about conductor yeah. um Intended to carry current in normal conditions, energized normal conditions, does not include a conductor solely for protective function. Uh, although we do call it the CPC, the circuit protective conductor. Yeah. Um, so, and, and quite often that is probably one of the most important conductors anyway. Um, as we all know, your circuit will work and a system will work whether it's earthed or not most of the time. Mm -hmm. um, and this is one of the ones that could be overlooked. I think so. That's, I think, that's an interesting sort of. Um, it is because remember, in these regulations, as it says at the top, though, it's only going to reference conductors with regards to risk. Yeah. So when we talk about insulation later on, or we talk about things like that, it'll probably use conductors for that purpose. But there is an area in earthing, so we'll see if it uses conductors there. Yeah. But, There's um, a thing there from Chris uh, how could these regulations be applied to domestic installations? Uh, if you're working on a domestic installation, doing installation, testing, inspecting, adding a circuit, changing a light fitting, putting an extra socket in, that's your place of work. So that now becomes your a place of work. Yeah. Uh, same as if someone goes to your home to do other work and they're using your electrical system. Um, or you could you know, have someone working at your place of work, um, at your home as a place of work. It's a, it's a fine line. All right, systems. So I think we've kind of talked about systems already. Includes all parts of system, conductors, equipment in it, and not a reference solely for the functional circuit as a whole. Okay. Okay, I'm not gonna go through all of this because we'll just, we'll be here all day. Um, maybe connected to a common source of electrical energy. It's ready can be made live by a system is therefore considered to be part of the system. This was, this was interesting. So the definition of a system, this includes equipment, which although not energized, it can be connected to a common source of energy. So if it's readily capable of being made live by a system, it is therefore considered to be part of that system. For example, a light circuit, which has been disconnected from its source of energy by means of removable links or fuses. So if you've pulled the fuse, as a way of killing a circuit, it is still part of the system if it can easily be re-energized. Okay, so when you see cables or circuits and boards and things that have been officially decommissioned, if they are actually still connected and you just require some kind of insertion of a fuse, that is still effectively recognized as a system um, here. So bear that in mind. So the interesting thing there is that if you disconnect a circuit, we all come across fuse boards with circuits that have been disconnected and the cables are taped up and brought up on the back of the board. Uh, mm -hmm. And you think, what the hell, you know, what is all this about? Um, if they've only disconnected the line conductor or the line of neutral conductor and left the CPC connected, then it's still part of the system. If you look at number yeah, 17. Yeah, because it'll be, it'll be um, subsequent to fault currents. Yeah. Potentially. So according to 17, it's still part of the system. Yeah. Okay, equipment. <clears throat> this includes every type of equipment, for example, high voltage transmission overhead lines to battery powered hand lamps. So this is the bit that tells us about the scope being total scope where we apply these regulations. Uh, and the reason things like simple little hand lamps are also within the scope of this, even like little battery torches and things, and is because there's a risk of ignition if you work in dangerous environments. Okay, 
So it mentions here about uh, explosion risks, which could be caused by even very low levels of energy, okay, igniting flammable gases. So, you know, I mean, we've just started talking about um, Compex over an E5 podcast. You know, the selection of equipment that doesn't have any risk of exposure to spark gaps or little ignition sources. So the selection and use of all equipment is within the scope. Okay, uh, this is conductors here. Any material capable of conducting electricity and therefore includes both me uh, metals and all other conducting materials. Okay, so that's what conductors are. There's a little illustration here of types of conductors and we can see here, we can understand this as a delta system, three phase delta system, neutral on earth. It's not really, you know, an, it's not really an electrical manual, this document is trying to simplify as best as it can. Within these dotted lines, conductors are conductors in a system since they're electrically connected to a common source of electrical energy. So source here, you've got these conductors here and this equipment here. It's all part of the same system because they're all connected together. These are conductors in a system. So we've got here, what we've got here, we've got exposed conductive parts. We've got here a CPC and a protected conductor but not circuit conductors because they are apparently according to the definition, not energized. So, but they're still conductors in the system. So it's an interesting terminology used there. Okay, let's move on to, uh, do we need to go through danger? Danger and injury. Uh, no, let's just move. I mean, we understand uh, danger and injury. Danger is the risk of injury. Injury is determined. We've looked at the definition of injury earlier on. We mentioned uh, burns, we mentioned electric shock, we mentioned, you know, all those thermal effects that the fundamental principles will push. Okay. Oh, there we go. Electric burns, electric shock. So it's all in here. It's all in here for you to see. But electric shock, how it behaves, electric shock. Sensation of shock is only one such effect is extremely painful, etc. Before you move on from there, yeah. you know, that's a, that is quite important that we look at all of those A, B, C, D and E, because too many times and too much emphasis is all on about electric shock. And we tend to forget with electrical systems that we've got to also prevent the hazards uh, and the risk of injury from burns, okay, fires, electric arcing explosions. And we tend to quite often ignore that. And there's all this emphasis on, oh, let's so, you know, pre prevent from electric shock. Mm. And we tend to forget these other risks. It's well, like I mean, we talked about uh, short circuit current. Yeah. We've, we've talked about that a few times. But again, um, if we, the fundamental principles of 7671 should achieve these. They do. You know, so this is a follow on. We're going to, we are going to do a follow on um, thing. Uh, I know it's something, that's something that Paul wants to do is look at how you know how we can link the fundamental principles of 767 with these specific areas of risk as they go through these legislations yeah. uh yeah these are the natural likely effects of shock current maintaining influenced by voltage frequency duration and impedance in the current path yeah uh seems fairly obvious mentions here about a few milliamps can cause fatal electric shock okay Again, do do revisit this, download this, and make sure you're happy that it match. It should mirror a lot of things that we understand from seven six seven one and other things that we've already discussed. Okay, yeah, you should always yeah. consider the convention public electrical supply of two thirty as potentially fatally dangerous. I like that sentence. Yeah, that's why consider. we should do it. The conventional public electrical supply of 230 volt as potentially fatally dangerous. Yeah. That's why we shouldn't do the old um, wet the finger and touch the end of the cable <laughs> as a method of testing. And how many times have we seen that over the years? Yeah. Guys doing that. Oh, just check if it's dead. What mm -hmm. are you doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. So remember, this is, this is the guidance information that the HSE have put in HSR 25 here to help understand the risk factor that these regulations are there to support, okay? And this is guidance right now we're going through, because this, this big blue area is guidance, okay? 
This is guidance to support these specific terms. Just reminding us of where we're at. There's lots of it. Fire of electrical origin here. We can start with a number of ways. Overheating of cables and equipment due to overloading. Leakage currents due to poor or inadequate insulation. Have all materials stored too close to equipment. I saw something like that not long ago. From materials by arcing or sparking of equipment. Scattering of hot particles. Okay, all of these are mentioned here. This is interesting as well. We've got here um, arcing causes a particular type of burn injury from other types. Okay, ultraviolet radiation causes damage similar to severe sunburn. On its own, it can cause damage to sensitive skin and the eyes. So it talks here about the need to think. You know, this is electricity work rigs, but it's talking about arc flashovers. Okay, we don't talk about that that much in seven six seven one. Okay. Yeah. Energy dissipated in the arc. Um, they could be short as 0.2 seconds. They could be longer, yeah. depending on obviously the the uh, the plasma itself. Um, There's a mention there of the molten metal particles, which penetrate and burn and lodge in the flesh. Yeah. And this is um, why we should be looking at eye protection as a minimum. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're doing any work which involves live conductors, and that well, includes key... inspection and testing. The key thing with any kind of life, I mean, we know life work is supposed to be avoided at all times and, you know, and it, we have to like only do it when it's absolutely necessary. Then we have to escalate the control mechanisms. One of the things we must do when we have to escalate it to live work is understand what level of energy can occur if things were to go wrong. So we have to look at the, uh, the arc flash boundary and the actual safe working distance. Uh, it's like I've done a lot of work in over, um, over time. Uh, but again, um, we can we can do a little art flash webinar uh, at a later date. If you are interested in looking more at art flash, though, um, just do a Google of um, NFPA 70E and IEEE 1584. Um, those will give you the initial points to reference because that's all over from the US at the moment. Yeah, it's something as simple as wearing a pair of uh, safety glasses when you're doing a live test of, say, earth loop impedance or fault current at a board. Mm -hmm. You know, it's some some of these things are very easy to just accommodate within a, 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 well, again, a reasonable I mean, level of health and safety. If you if you're at work and you ignore that, and something happens and you get something in your eye, then the guidance about the risk of arcing in this document, arcing is mentioned in the legislation, and then in this document, the guidance tells you about understanding this arc and actually selecting suitable equipment. So, all right, other words used, okay. Um, charged or live, the term charged and live have two different meanings. They're not defined in regulations, so they'll take their ordinary meaning. So if it says live, it means it's connected to a source. Okay, that makes sense. So it's, it's you know, it's not isolated. Charged means it has acquired a charge either because it is live or because it's become charged by other means. Could be uh, static, induction charging, capacitive coupling. It could be that you've got a battery or some whatever, okay? But it's got a state of charge. How many times have you disconnected a piece of equipment and there's a capacitor in there that still has a little charge and maybe you have to have a discharge resistor or just wait a period of time before you then escalate the work? Testing yeah. the length of MI cable. Yeah. When you do insulation resistance test on a piece, long piece of MI cable. And you run that test for a period of time and you build up a little you grab hold of the cable. Ends. Yeah. <laughs> dead is not defined as regulations, so it takes its ordinary meaning, which means dead means dead. So it's neither live or charged. Okay. I use these two terms when I clear when I deliver systems of work, I have to identify if anything is connected to a source of energy, so it's live or if it's been disconnected, but still maintains charge. Both being live and or charged result in you being potentially at risk. And what we need to try to do is achieve the scenario of dead. And we'll see these used later on in regulations 13 and 14 about dead work, live work. High voltage, low voltage, BS7671, um, if you know that, then you'll know this. So high voltage is the excess of the scope of 7671. So 1000 volts AC upwards, 1500 volts DC upwards is HV. Live work, and I've had to come back to this particular paragraph a number of times. Live work is work on or near conductors that are accessible and live or charged. That's on or near, okay? 
near obviously is depending on you know you've got there's no specific guidance on distance of near but remember that this applies to people at work as well so if you are an electrician on site opening up a control panel okay the employees have to follow these regulations and if you are creating an additional risk in their place of work you've created that risk so you've got to identify and control that so we'll have warnings we'll have boundaries we'll have accompaniments we'll have whatever we need to safely control the risk if we cannot control the risk then the work doesn't go ahead simple as that so for instance the other day when you were doing the thermal imaging survey and you took that buzz bar cover off on the buzz bar chamber yeah. although you're not actually working or touching the actual bars the live bars it's still mm -hmm. live work because you are working near it yeah well the process of this was to assess the risk of energy with the removal of the panel so i had category two arc flash helmet gloves and all that if i felt the need for the removal of the panel but that you get really really hot in so once that work was then done you would then obviously if you needed to use that you'd then take that off and then you'd stay at a distance we call this the safe working boundary in the arc flash term and with thermal imaging i need to be at a distance anyway not too far away but i can maintain a distance but if i was to go up to it i'd have gloves and if i need to go into it i'd have then category zero zero gloves yeah. So you, you, the problem is if you say, right, that one task, yes, let's say, okay, identify panel, loosen panel, remove panel, put panel down, look at the thing, look at the camera, make an observation, pick panel up, pick screws up. If you put that all down as one task, you'd have to have that one task with the highest level of PPE. Yeah. And that makes the investigation work very challenging when you've got all this crap on. So instead you break it down to smaller tasks yeah. and that way you can minimize the extent of life work. And this is where method statements and uh, come in really, because they're really useful for that. You can look at each stage of the task and you can apply the appropriate PPE and uh, safety factors for each stage of that task. Well, that's how I wrote the RAM. Uh, I yeah. basically said, you know, so once I've determined this, you know, and I'll have, I'll have uh, barriers. I had, a, I had like barriers available if I needed them. But when I was actually at that one in particular, I had, uh, we had two escorts and another engineer with me who were basically standing behind uh, maintaining the work. And I was in the corner of a, of a factory. So yeah. this like last sentence, you... sorry. Yeah. This uh, last sentence is good here. Note that testing of live exposed conductive, uh, live exposed conductors is live work. So if you're yeah. using a test instrument and you're testing live conductors, that is live work. So doing a loop test live is live work. That doesn't mean we want to try to stop doing those tests, though, as we said the other night. So we need to identify how it's seen in the legislation and then control the risk. And as, as I was, as what I was just going to mention there was the fact that when we do the inspection and testing, when we when we actually teach inspection and testing on the two three nine one courses, we're always testing, telling the guys when they're doing the live tests at the board, the full current test and the uh, earth loop impedance testing at the board with the board cover off. Then obviously they have to wear the appropriate PPE and have the appropriate safety standards in place. Mm -hmm. And then as soon as possible, yeah, we get them to put the cover back on before they then go on to start yeah. lining up the circuits and doing minimizing, the circuit tests. Yeah. Minimizing extent of live so work. Doing the, doing the actual uh, thing in, in different stages and applying the appropriate PPE and safety methods for the different stages. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, if you write things down that way, um, you'll find often your RAMs and your system of work will just always be straight away acknowledged and followed because it's written, you're writing it step by step. If you just wrote, Oh, I'm going to do a panel. I'm going to look at that one next, and that's it. That the, the the person's authorizing you their workplace to work in won't have a clue as to how you're going to do that work. But if you say, right, well, we'll verify this, then we will do this, and we'll do this, and we'll do that, then Dave, you've got it written down how you're going to do it. They can say, yes, let's do it that way. And if you, you know, if you then work outside of that, you work beyond your ramp. All right. So that's definitions, really. So let's go to regulation three. So. Persons on whom duties are imposed by these regs. So we've got here, except where otherwise expressly provided in these regulations is to be the duty of every employer and self-employed person 
to comply with the provisions of these regulations insofar as they relate to matters which are within their control and then some other crap about mines here so mine operators in relations to mines um something something about mines all right yeah. uh, we're moving on from my anyone here actually work in mines where i have to actually mention it i thought not okay so employers and self-employed and this is the key to matters which are within his or her control and i no, always no, went, it's, it's not very pc at the moment no no That's it's one not. reason why it needs updating because it, does. It, it, it keeps referring to his yeah. um you know and uh yeah the, the the lady electricians out there you know um yeah. yeah it must be quite annoying to them because let's face it you know it's yeah. electrical when trade, I, especially yeah. is a, a, a multi sort of it's it's just yeah I mean, it's just a, it's like a grandfather terminology or a grandfather kind yeah. of thing that needs to a little bit of an update now this word control i always always focus on this word when i talk to health and safety managers or organizers because whenever there's a mechanism of right we need to have somebody trained to do something we have a person who we want to be able to do this i go well, okay well we've got to make sure they have sufficient skill and training and resources and time and all this stuff and we make sure that the employers can provide enough support that they can actually maintain control of this risk and therefore the employer will go down to the employee with all of the resources and that must all be audited, you know, auditable, auditable and all like evidenced. But then the employee must have control as well. Uh, and it must be within their control. If there's a scenario that is not within your control, then this has gone wrong, massively wrong. And that's what always needs to be assessed for, making sure that mechanisms are in place to always maintain control of the risk employees will cooperate with his or her employer so far as is necessary to enable any duty placed on that employer to buy the provisions of these regulations so if you compromise let's say you do something completely different um you know then that's against this regulation okay you must cooperate uh the management of health and safety at work regulations has a specific regulation that says if you are an employee in a place of work and you see something that is dangerous at work and you choose just to ignore it because maybe it's not your area it's not your job it's not your responsibility there's a legislation that says no you should have highlighted that so if you spent a day working in a cubicle and there's an exposed socket and your job is to just give tickets out if you ignore that risk, yeah, if you're competent enough to identify that risk, such as a broken, smashed open socket, then you should be reporting it. Now, there are some risks that you just can't foresee because you may not have that technical knowledge. But, you know, some obvious things, you would need to report that. So the employee will cooperate with the employer to enable any duty placed on that employer by the provisions of these regulations. And they'll comply with the provisions of these regulations again so far as it relates to matters which are within their control. So an employer can provide an employee with a safe electrical system to work with. If the employee then decides to smash the crap out of the switch gear because they're having a bad day, to use it inappropriately, then as long as the switch gear is suitable for the nature of the work, the employee will then be responsible because that is that, that area and that equipment and that system was in their control. If they misuse equipment, then they will be responsible for it. What you must what we must remember though is they must be competent to use the equipment. You know, so if someone goes to work and sits at a desk, PC and stuff, same kind of plugging in stuff that you have at home. There's very little levels of improved technical knowledge needed to safely use that. Maybe a little bit of a talk about safe, in, you know, the visual inspection and pack testing. If you have a person that's using a, a complicated piece of machinery or something, then there's, there's a huge, uh, huge list of questions that you're going to have to say about the person's knowledge, about their training, about the monitoring of their training, and the authorization. So as long as the employer has all of that, then the ownership of the control remains with the employee. So when I do audits or I work with companies and I do like a duty holder meet, uh, investigation, for example, I'll look at people at work and I'll be asking myself if they are using equipment suitably, if they're using it properly, maybe they're 
using it in a you know i remember working at a factory once and the guy has actually he 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 moved the product in front of the e-stop of the oven he was loading product onto because he wanted to work that way around instead of putting it in the grid they painted on the floor for the product to be placed on he liked working that way around instead of that way he said it's because he had a bad back or something but he blocked the emergency switch gear yeah now, all of the guides and all of the markings were provided by the employer, and the employer had evidence that the guy knew where that was and how to use it, but he chose to work his own way. So he had control, and he goofed it. And so had anything gone wrong, he would have been capable for that. Employer. For the purposes of eggs, an employer is any person who employs one or more individuals under contract of employment or apprenticeship, or provides training under the schemes to which the Health and Safety at Work Act applies through the Health and Safety Training for Employment Regulations. Now, I've not heard of that. Um, I'm sure I should imagine that's a. Have you heard of this? Health and Safety Training for Employment Regulations. No, no. Okay, maybe there's some schemes under that as well, which recognise an employer from somebody who's not typically, uh, well, what we would consider an employer to be. Self-employed person is an individual who works for gain or reward. That, that might cover people, you know, like the old um, work experience. Mm, maybe. That might cover them. Maybe. Because quite often with work experience people um, in the years gone by, I don't know if they still do it actually. Mm. Um, yeah, so you haven't got a contract of employment, but you, you don't have, have some a contract level of employment. You don't actually pay the person because so effectively they're not employed by you. However, yeah. they are still working under your guidance. So that might be covering those. Yeah. Okay, I, you've mentioned this before. Uh, a self-employed person is an individual who works for gain or reward. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be a doesn't monetary. Have to be money. It doesn't have to be monetary, does it? Yeah. It could be. You, you know, could you be do... working for kind in kind. So you might do a job for a plumber, for instance. Um, he services hmm. your boiler, and you test his electrics. Yeah, you are still like at that. work, even yeah. though no money's changed hands. Yeah. So. Employee. Okay, um, Okay. so Regulation 32A reiterates the duty placed on employees. Okay, duties on employees equivalent to those placed on employers and self-employed, who are these matters are, uh, where, these, where these matters are within their control. Okay, so again, if you're ever kind of determining who's responsible, this is what you're looking for. Has control effectively been passed down to the employee? If the employee has effectively been passed down control, then the employee is responsible for that. Okay, um, yeah, the control which they exercise over the electrical safety in any particular circumstance will determine to what extent they hold responsibilities under the regulations and to ensure that these are complied with. This is the key word here, okay? I, we use this a lot in um, when, when we look at health and safety and trying to authorize people to do certain work you know, there are many places of work where they want people who can go into a switch room and then they want people who can't go into a switch room but can go into a control panel, yeah? Or they may want people to be able to reset a breaker but they're not allowed to go uh, to do life work or to change a breaker. So these are all very different, uh, varying levels of authorization. Whenever they authorize people, they have to have evidence of control of those authorizations. Person may find themselves responsible for causing danger to arise elsewhere in a system at a point beyond their own installation. This situation could arise, for example, due to unauthorized or unscheduled backfeeding from their installation onto the system or raising the fault power level on the system above rated and agreed maximum levels due to connected extra generation capacity. Because such circumstances are within their control, the effect of regulation three is to bring responsibilities for compliance with the rest of the regulations to that person, thus making them a duty holder. That's interesting. Yeah. So you can actually, you know, you can. I mean, what would an example of that be? If you if you're doing a event, for instance, using a generator. Right. And you may be connecting your generator to uh, parallel to a um, system within a building. Yeah. Okay. To obviously you've got additional load and stuff, so you might not not have enough load from the right, actual so existing supply. So you might use a generator supply to come into the building. You've got to make sure that your system is not connected to the existing system in such a way that it would backfeed to it. Um, and if it so does, you're then responsible for it. 
you're responsible for it. You're responsible for the system inside the building as well as the system you're putting in. Mm. If you make that, if you're making those connections, and if you, for some reason or other, do connect the two systems together without any sort of proper thought. Mm. Yeah, I mean, ideally, that's just something you wouldn't want. Okay, absolute and reasonably practicable. Now we see these mentioned a few times, and I see reasonably practicable used as a oh well, it's only reasonably practicable, which means we don't have to do it if it's reasonably practical it's not a have to um so this just explains this duties in some of these regs are subject to the qualifying term of reasonably practicable if they're absent so if reasonably practicable is absent then the requirement in regulations is then going to be absolute so if a regulation does not say if reasonably practicable then the regulation is by default absolute yeah the meaning of this reasonably practical has been well established in law okay and we'll see what this kind of means in a minute so absolute yeah if the requirement is not qualified by words like reasonably practical then the requirement must be met regardless of cost of any other consideration okay regulations making such absolute requirements are subject to the defense regulation of 29 which we see right towards the end However, if it says reasonably practical, how do we know what, how far that goes? Right. Generally, you should do everything reasonably practicable to protect people from harm. This means balancing the level of risk against the measures needed to control the real risk in terms of money, time, or trouble. However, you do not need to take action if it would be grossly disproportionate to the level of risk. Grossly disproportionate. In the context of these regulations, then, if the risk is very often that of death, okay, like, for example, electrocution, and we've seen further up in the book there, there's fire, there's arcs, there's many different causes, risks of injury, and subsequently potentially death. But the nature of the precautions which can be taken are so often very simple and cheap, such as insulation, then the level of duty to prevent that danger approaches that of an absolute duty. Okay, so it's basically just saying if you can apply something like insulation or something of low cost, that's not, you know, very simple and cheap is uh, what they're saying here, then that really needs to be pushed really right to the absolute duty term. All right. I mean, you re relate this back to what we were talking about a while ago, which was talking about inspection and testing and having the cover off a board. So you're doing a live earth loop impedance test and fault current test. Mm -hmm. testing the life polarity coming in that sort of stuff um would you wear arc flash protection for that no you wouldn't okay mm -hmm. you wouldn't wear a full arc suit but you would consider obviously using insulated tools wearing eye protection that sort of stuff and making sure you've got the right equipment you're not using a, a, a 30 you know 30 bob tester that you bought down the market so yeah you 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 apply the rules it's as far as uh the um, reasonably practical, you are safe. So you never, not, you can't be absolutely safe no. if you're doing live testing. But it's not but a get out of jail card, is it? It's not an excuse no. to not escalate. Yeah. So uh, again, as we said at the beginning of this, this the if we can develop and enhance our understanding of electricity at work regulations, we can really communicate well with the client. And if you can actually communicate with the client the difference between absolute requirement and reasonably practicable, then we can they can re, re they can re review what the cost implication is yeah because it might be that they are that most often they are the persons that make you call it reasonably practicable because yeah. they are most often the persons that create the issue of cost or trouble okay we often get asked about this don't we people say well if this happens and this happens, you know, there could be a problem. We were talking about something the other day where we were looking at the fact of we can make things safe, but we can only legislate for single fault conditions. Mm -hmm. If we have multiple fault conditions, we can't legislate for that. You know, the only way to make things absolutely safe with multiple fault conditions is to install self, you know, with, yeah. you know, double insulation and, and all sorts of other things. Have everything you know, isolated. Uh, and you can't do that so you can only legislate for single fault conditions and people do get worried sometimes they think yeah but if this happens and then that happens and then something else happens yeah well yeah if a jumbo jet lands on your house you're going to die you know uh you can only legislate for certain things 
it's not a get out of jail card for doing things lackadaisy, but you must, you know, you, you, you've got to sort of have, get some sleep at night. You can't yeah. worry about every individual sort of situation. But you, you can, for multiple faults. if you're reporting to a client, you can actually say, here's a level of risk. And you can, remember, we're supposed to think about like limitations. We must agree them with the client. It yeah. might be that if you say, for example, oh, this is going to stay this risk because it's not reasonably, you know, it's not really practicable uh, to do this because of cost. You make sure the client agrees with you on that. Yeah. yeah. It might be the wrong time, but the client might say, well, we could do it at another time. So make sure the client agrees that it is too expensive or it's the wrong time or it is too much trouble. Yeah. Because yeah. it's up to them. Yeah to comply with the legislation. And if you determine something to be a potential risk that is acceptable, they have to know why it's going to be left and why you've considered it to be, uh, you know, too much or whatever. That's um, why risk you, you assessment is get such a good tool. Of, yeah. You can even get some kind of agreement with them that they can then review later on, you know, if they can improve things over time. There's a question earlier about insulation resistance testing. Is it considered live work? You know, now, we all, we've always considered it to be live work because that circuit or that part of the system is basically charged to 500 volts by the insulation resistance tester. Yeah. Um, what, what, you need to, what you need to do with that one, in my view, is remember that we're talking about electricity work regulations and system with a source of energy, conductors, and that energy being charged or live. Now, when you go into a system, an installation with an insulation resistance tester, what you're doing is you're taking your own system with its own source of energy and you're applying it onto that, you're connecting it onto that system. So you're basically giving those conductors a second source and you're providing 500 volts DC, which is LV. Yeah. So yeah. it's charged. You're, char you're charging the system. Yeah. yeah. So it's live so it's work. Live work. Yeah. I, and I mean, that's why we need to use the proper um, GS38 uh, equipment and probes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When we're doing insulation resistance testing, um, if Whereas anyone, we don't need to use those when we're doing continuity testing. Put it this way. If anybody was to try to prove that wrong, they'd have to rewrite this. Yeah. It'd have to be rewritten. Because the way it's written means that if you're going in with a source of energy, which is your batteries, and you're producing an output of 500 volts DC or 250 volts DC, LVDC starts at 120. ELV yeah. is up to 120. So you're in LV territory. So by definition... <laughs> you are working live because you're on the live system and your conductors are the live source uh, well, admittedly it's only a very low current but um, it's a low it's a low current but people will respond to the voltage yeah but as we've always said that they, you've got to consider what will happen if you've got somebody who's working anywhere near metalwork becomes charged yeah. because of your insulation resistance test and they get a well off it it's not the fact they're going to get electrocuted because it's only a very low current mm. but their reaction to that could be Enough Again, to knock them off the top of a pair of steps or off a, a scaffold or whatever. Yeah. yeah. So there's in, other risks involved. In isolation training and other training, this is what this is what I call a secondary effect. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be electrocution, fire, burns, flash. It could be. And I, I did a, I did an investigation at a factory where an electrician died um, in 2010. He was working on a motor up a ladder. He got a little shock, but he fell off the ladder and broke his back on the, a big mixer bowl. So it was the falling from the height, the secondary effect that yeah. was actually the, you know, which resulted in fatality. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, this is something that you might find interpreted differently by trainers or other people that go, nah, that's just silly. But all we're doing is we're looking at the black and white of the legislation, the regulations and applying the theory of the testing and we're joining the dots. And that's what they say to us in this. Okay, um, so that's absolute and reasonably practicable. Um, and this does, we keep saying about the idea of modifying our EOCRs. This is a good thing that I think could be added to your reporting work, that communication with the clients um, about, you know, things being reasonably practicable due to cost, risk, um, trouble. Yeah. Get that agreement with them and maybe, you know, let them own that. And then they can then evaluate later on if they want to escalate or improve things. We talked about that in relation to the collapse of wiring systems. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Regulation four: systems, work activities, and protective equipment. 
Okay, so big white box is the quote of the regulation itself, and then the guidance starts here with the blue, and the paragraphs resume, 60, 61, just in case you're trying to drag through this document. So all systems shall at all times be of such construction as to prevent so far as reasonably practicable danger. Okay, so that's a, that's a pretty clean cut sentence, isn't it? All systems will be at all times construction preventing danger. So if your system has ineffective construction at any time that can result in danger, then you've got an immediate problem. Okay, so you go around a place of work, you see maybe some trunking lid or some equipment or some exposure. Let's say you've got some uh, lidding missing or you've got IP ratings and the construction isn't sufficient, the fixings are poor. If the construction could prevent, uh, could uh, lead to danger, the construction is not preventing danger. Yeah. So an immediate thing that you could pull up on that. Again, to prevent danger, all systems shall be maintained, okay, to prevent such danger so far as is reasonably practicable. I, I highlight this one all the time because when I, we go to places, we talk about maintenance, we make sure that the maintenance is sufficient to prevent danger, okay? If danger has not been prevented by maintenance, maybe you've got a place that has a lack of maintenance. You go to a site, there's switch gear that's 20 years old, had little to no maintenance. You notice that, you know, maybe maybe you need to do some um, torque, uh, torque tightening on them or whatever. You can say, right, this has a need for more regular maintenance. And if you see a potential danger, you can then highlight this. You can say that the maintenance right now is not sufficient to prevent danger. Okay, and that's regulation four two. This is this is not the guidance. This bit. This is the regulation. This is the statutory bit, and you can highlight that. Every activity of work, including operation, that's just using it. Yeah, use maintenance of a system, working near a system. Okay, so it could be your work isn't on the system but is near it. Is carried in such a manner as not to give rise, again, to danger. So when you're doing an EICR, one of the things you should be thinking about is what's, what's the external influence category for the utilization? That's, um, whew, can't remember now, B something. Utilization of the personnel, making sure they're using the equipment safely or working around the equipment safely. You can highlight that. And if you think they're not using it properly or not trained to use it properly, maybe they're misusing leads, misusing sockets, taking equipment outside, ignoring RCDs or whatever they're doing. I was at a place not long ago and there was a convector heater, freestanding convector heater, not fixed to the wall, but the legs were missing. So I'm immediately thinking, okay, if anyone's actually going to use that, there's immediately a risk of danger because of the misuse of equipment. So it has to be risen or removed. So always look at the work activity and maybe look at those who work near the system, but not on the system itself. And if there's a risk of danger, you can raise that. Then this one, I think, was it Daniel early on who pulled this up? Okay. Yeah. So any equipment provided under the regulations for the purpose of protecting persons at work on or near equipment is suitable for the use for which it is provided be maintained in a condition suitable for that use and be properly used. Now, suitable for use for which it is provided. So that is going to, you know, this RCD question. Yeah. That's, uh, if you see, uh, if you see ACRCDs, you're not going to immediately go, whoa, 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 whoa. we've got to go to that regulation. What you're going to do is try to observe the equipment because, you know, BS7671 still says general use. So you've got to observe the equipment if it's suitable for use. Yeah. Is it maintained in a condition suitable for that use? So maintain, do remember that some equipment can get boxed in. Some equipment can not be cleaned. Some switch gear can have swarf and stuff inside there as well. And some equipment can get painted over. All right. And if it's maintained properly, it will be reinstated as much as it can back to the original manufacturer's requirements. So it will not be blocked. It will not be covered. It will not be painted. Okay. Or if that has happened, the manufacturer's requirements 
will not be compromised. All right, this regulation covers in a general way those aspects of systems and equipment and work on or near these, which are fundamental to electrical safety. Um, again, let regulation four, um, it's the one that drives the need for maintenance. So I pick that up all the time. It's the one that requires us to safely control the workplace for those working near the system or on the system itself. Okay. And with regards to equipment itself, you know, the suitable use or maintaining of them, all of that is there. So there's some guidance on this. Okay. Um, construction has a wide application. Okay, it may be considered to be the physical condition of the arrangement of the equipment of the component during its life. Okay, with life, what you've got to remember is equipment has intended lives, but some equipment's life may have, you know, passed it now. You might have equipment that really is life uh, extinct. It's, it's just past its use. Um, and you can recommend that. You can recommend, recommend that some equipment is past its life cycle. Okay, uh, in assessing the suitability of the construction of the system, consideration should be given to all likely or reasonably foreseeable conditions of actual application or use of equipment in the system. This includes testing, commissioning, operation, and maintenance. So you see a piece of equipment, look at its construction, make sure it's suitable for testing, commissioning, operation, okay, throughout the life. I, um, how many times have you gone to a board or some switch gear that's not accessible anymore? because it was directed in place. And then a couple of years later, somebody has blocked it off or has made the space where you work on it much smaller. Okay. Little things like that can affect the ability to maintain or even operate equipment throughout its life. Things in particular you should consider manufacturers assigned or other certified rating, likely loads and fault conditions, need for suitable protective devices, fault level at the points of supply and any contribution to the fault level from the connected loads such as motors okay um if, if you think about ps7671 with protected device selection fault conditions and loading all of that should be fairly evident environmental condition itself mechanical strength how many times have you seen equipment used maybe outdoors or used in a environment that it's not suitable due to risks of impact so if you find equipment that's not suitable due to it being under severe risk of impact, maybe you've got a EICR and you see a socket that's been knocked, you can actually say, well, the environmental condition isn't good for mechanical strength of the construction of this equipment. And that brings you to push regulation 4.1 on your recommendations to the client. Okay, it's a good little, good little thing to refer to. Here again is an area where this does need updating. Consider this was uh, written in 1989. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when you look at those risks, it doesn't mention there the the possibility of the effect of the um, connected equipment and what it may, the effect that that connected equipment may have on the system and on the protective systems that are in place. Uh, and again, this is going back to RCDs. Whereas if you actually yeah. read the regulation in itself, it does cover that. If you go back up a little bit, yeah, uh, a little bit more, yeah. Um, 63, assessing the suitability, the likely and reasonably foreseeable conditions application of the electrical equipment of the system. Now we are now aware of the fact that certain pieces of equipment, you know, washing machines, EV charging, inverters, all sorts of other bits and pieces, induction hobs, will have an effect on RCD, standard AC RCDs. We're mm. aware of that, so it's covered within there. But because this was written in 1989, it doesn't actually pick it out in the following bit in 64. It needs a bit. So that is somewhere where it needs to be updated. Well, I don't know, maybe... We, maybe... Need, we, need, to, you know, we need to consider it, because we know it. But, yeah. uh, well, maybe one of these companies will write a book soon about this. Yeah. Maybe we'll know I've just said that. Okay. Um, the risk that a system may create to adjacent work activities and the public, okay? The manner in which commissioning, testing, and subsequent maintenance or other work may need to be carried out. So again, we know when we do a design, we've got to think about the need for maintenance throughout the life, okay? But it's the same here. It's mentioned here under the statutory regulations to consider, okay, for equipment. 
let's move on. Um, four two is the need for maintenance there to be done to ensure the safety of the system rather than the activity of doing the maintenance in a safe manner, which is four three. So four two is the need for maintenance. Four three is the need for maintenance to be able to be carried out safely. The maintenance should be sufficient to prevent danger. Okay. Inspection and where necessary testing. I love that. I love that sentence. Because how many times do we just say we we keep forgetting about inspection, don't we? Inspection is, is totally overlooked in many cases, mm. especially with the ICRs. People mm. it's all about this make, make, take a few earth loop impedance tests and then we'll sit in the van and make the rest up. The uh, inspection yeah. part of it is totally overlooked and it is the most important bit. And so, that's the I mean, bit that takes the time. Yeah, you know, so you can you can quote this. You can go right. Well, HSR twenty five actually where it says inspection, and if we want to, test. Yeah. Yeah. We must inspect, and if necessary, test on equipment. An essential part of preventing maintenance program. Okay. This this is why these these inspection and testing things where you get paid four pound a circuit or whatever is total garbage. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't get paid anything for doing the inspection, but you get paid four pounds for putting a test result down for a circuit. Total garbage. Yeah. You're paid for productivity, and productivity is yeah. evidence with numbers on boxes, not with uh, a good detailed inspection. Yeah. All right. Practical experience of use may indicate an adjustment to the frequency at which preventative maintenance needs to be carried out. This is a matter of the judgment of the duty holder who should seek all the information they need to make this judgment, including reference to the equipment manufacturer's guidance. Remember the duty holder is the person who has that sole responsibility. So frequency, we can recommend frequencies, but the actual frequency is determined by the duty holder, which is a person who is in charge of that electrical installation, who has decided to put people at work in that system. We saw this mentioned in the PAT testing code when it was last updated, they changed the label. So we know we no longer put the next test date. We just say, oh, this is the test date, but then the duty holder will determine the future frequency interval, okay? We should make sure the duty holder is well informed on how to determine a suitable interval. We can recommend, that's fine, but we shouldn't tell them when it's due. Mm. They should know how to. And they, if they seek your assistance with that, fine. Records can aid demonstration of compliance and allow useful analysis of equipment conditions. Keeping records is not a legal requirement. Maintenance records, including test results, preferably kept throughout the working life of the system, will allow the condition of the equipment and the effectiveness of the maintenance policies to be monitored. Without effective monitoring, duty holders cannot be certain the requirements for maintenance has been complied with. So it doesn't say you must keep records, but it says, how can you confirm compliance with your maintenance if you cannot track the performance of your system you know your your data all right we mentioned this yesterday was it yeah no thursday when we we're talking about the missing tests and we also yeah. mentioned the fact not just some of the tests and inspections that are missing it's also some of the record keeping that's missing we do tests on uh bonding conductors we do tests on main earth conductors and we put a tick in the box on the test sheet why don't we put the actual result down you know, when we do all the tests on earth loop impedance on three phase systems, why don't we put the actual result down for every phase? You know, testing uh, line neutral uh, continuity, put the test result down. So there's lots of tests that we actually take and we get results for. We don't mm. actually enter on the, on the test sheet. Whereas if we had those records and we had that data, we could use that for useful analysis to see how the installation, the condition of the installation is deteriorating over a period of time. It's yeah. in there. It's in the electricity at work regulations. Why don't we do it? No. You, it's because it's not right. in the on-site guide. Right. Yeah. Okay, four, three. This requires work activities of any sort, whether directly or indirectly associated with the system, to carry it out in a way which, so far as we be practicable, does not give rise to danger. Regulations 12 to 16 provide more specific requirements for this, which we'll see later. This is about working dead or working live and competence. Then it says, see electricity at work, safe working practices for more information. Okay, so uh, I've mentioned in isolation training stuff, things like uh, documents like HSG85, which is safe working procedures, um, which includes, you know, systems of work. Um, in the case of work, it's preferable conductors are made dead before work starts. You know, regulations 12, 13 and 14. 
In such cases, it's essential the equipment is isolated. Note that isolation is defined in the regulation, which includes securing by locking off. This guidance will actually tell us in paragraph 75 the need for locking off, okay, as well. The conductor is proved dead at the point of work before the work starts, and if a test instrument or voltage indicator is used for this purpose, this device should itself be proved immediately before and immediately after testing the conductors. This is where our safe isolation procedure originates from this kind of guidance. Safe systems of work incorporating the safe isolation procedures are important for work on equipment which is to be made dead before work starts. Consideration is needed for multiple sources of supply or alternative generation. This is also discussed under regulations 12 and 13 where we'll see the guidance being quite familiar. Some work though, such as fault finding and testing or live jointing by the electrical supply industry may require equipment to remain energized during the work. In these cases, Regulation 14 makes particular requirements and Regulation 4.4 is also likely to be relevant in terms of protective equipment which may need to be provided. So it identifies here that fault finding and testing or live jointing may need to be carried out live. Okay. The operation, maintenance and testing of systems and equipment must only be carried out by those people who are competent for that work. Competence is a very key regulation which we'll cover right towards the end. If equipment or systems are decommissioned, they must be disconnected from all sources of supply and isolated. Similarly, equipment or systems which are disused or no longer required or abandoned for any reason should be disconnected from all sources of supply and isolated. Isolation as defined in Regulation 12. Uh, right. says, can I just come yeah. back to that? The interesting thing there, it says, um, uh, isolation requires taking effective steps to ensure it's dead and cannot become inadvertently re-energized or charged by induction or capacitance effects. So if we if we do take a circuit, if we uh, remove a circuit from a fuse board, we leave all the cabling in, so we end up with if, bunches if, of cables in the back of fuse boards. Those cables are running alongside the other existing circuits. They can pick up the voltage by induction. Yeah, so basically um, you'd have to remove them. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's recommending. But yeah. how many times do you go to fuse boards and find especially industrial commercial places, you find six, seven, eight uh, circuits all sort of taped up and you think, what the hell was all this about? Mm. And it's well, if they're going into, if those cables are going into a common wiring system, if they're, for mm. example, let's say it's an arm that's going on its own on its Jack Jones, then maybe that's okay if it's just a stray arm. But if it's going into a, a multiple, um, you know, a filled wiring system with other cables, you're going to have capacitive company, you're going to have induced voltages, most likely. Yeah. I can't, you know, I can't see you not having that. Um, so yeah. yeah, that would definitely uh, still be have to be considered as potentially charged, wouldn't it? All right, let's go to Regulation Four Four. The Defence Regulation Twenty Nine is available in any proceedings for an offence under this part of the regulation. Okay, the term protective equipment can be of wide application, but typically includes those special tools, protective clothing, and insulating screening materials necessary to do the work safely on live electrical equipment. The requirements for the precautions of this to prevent injury are met under Regulation 14, and it requires the equipment to be suitable for use, maintained in that condition and properly used. Maintained in that condition, so we'll have some sites where all the PPE will be in lockers, and when we develop systems of work, that includes the actual selection, the maintenance, the, you know, the cleaning, and the storing of your PPE. Uh, if you don't store it properly, it's not going to last. Okay. Regulation 4.4 is not qualified by so far as we see practicable, nor does the regulation refer either to the injury or the risk of injury, such as electrical danger. The impact of the regulation is that where protective equipment is provided in order to comply with any of the other regulations, the equipment must conform to the requirements of Regulation 4.4. Advice on safe work practices is given in HSE guidance. Okay. So that is an example where it does not qualify for the term so far as it is practical, Regulation 4.4, which was the one that said, any equipment provided under these regulations for the purpose of protecting persons at work or near equipment should be suitable for the use for which it is provided, be maintained in the condition suitable for that use and be properly used. That's not qualifying for really to be practical. Okay, now we're an hour and a half in. 
and <laughs> we're about to start kind of going through now so what i'm going to do is i'm going to start kind of skipping through hopefully what we've done so far is just showing you how much information is in hsr 25 so i'm going to start kind of skipping through and highlighting some key areas to kind of get through to the rest but we can return and revisit some areas in particular if you wanted to later on that's not a problem uh, on another pop, uh, webinar but i'd like to get done in the next half an hour or so so that um we can have some more of a saturday so regulation five strength and capability of equipment okay so this is this is this is the regulation here the white box no electrical equipment will be put into use where its strength and capability may be exceeded in such a way as may give rise to danger okay um do you see anything? Like thought, yeah. Do you see any mention of reasonably practicable? No. No. So, absolute. No equipment to be used if its strength or capability may be exceeded in such a way as to give rise to danger. Okay. So, strength and capability it mentions here the ability of equipment to withstand the thermal, electromagnetic, electrochemical, or other effects of electric currents, which might be expected to flow when the equipment is part of a system. So if you're on an EICR and you've got a device that will not accommodate a fault current, you might go, oh, that's a C2. But technically, it's non-compliant with an absolute regulation. Yeah? Which might be a bit more of an important message to get to your client. Yeah? So, again, think about the importance of understanding these regulations and how your observations might be a lot more uh, well-received by your client if you actually also compile a report about e uh, um, about electricity at work regulation um, compliance <clears throat> rating so the strength and rec capability of equipment is not necessarily the same as its rating usually the rating is that which has been assigned by the manufacturer following a number of agreed tests equipment should be used with the manufacturer's rating continuous intermittent or fault rating as appropriate and in accordance with any other instructions supplied with the equipment we also have to consider the environmental conditions with that, don't we? Yeah. It may have a certain rating from the manufacturer, but if we haven't installed it in the environment the, the manufacturer is expecting, i.e. if we've got a higher ambient temperature, etc., cetera, um, yeah. then obviously it's not going to be rated at that level. And this is, um, this is where we come to things like pollution categories, which um, I'm hoping to do some uh, or hear some information on from both polls very soon because they talk about pollution categories a lot, which is where you obviously take you know, one item from one area to another environment. And obviously it means the distances between the contacts should be greater and things like that. Um, so we do need to get some more information on those. Yeah. There's a mention there about um, PSC. Uh, Paul said, if you if have a PSC of 600 amps, you do the thermal stand to check if the cable can take it. What about the switches? Yeah, all the switches, all the all the control gear, everything that's involved in the circuit must be capable of taking that full um, full current. So you yeah. need to make sure that you've got the right rating of switches and controls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Okay, uh, regulation six: adverse or hazardous environments, equipment which may reasonably foreseeable foreseeably be exposed to mechanical damage effects of weather natural hazards temperature or pressure wet dirty dusty or corrosive conditions or any flammable or explosive substance including dust vapor or gases will be of such construction or as necessary protected as to prevent so far as is easily practicable so that is so far as easily practicable danger arising from such exposure and that's so far as we practical because we may be talking here about escalating an installation's wiring system it might be the source of vapor or dust is actually quite confined in an installation. Um, or if you talk about, you know, the ATEX complex territory, then you're talking about a huge investment in your wiring system upgrade. Okay, so, you know, you, you can always try to overcomplicate. You can see words like explosive, dust, vapors, and you think, oh, that immediately means adverse or hazardous environments immediately means, you know, offshore or petrol or things like that but mechanical damage weather yeah that's every installation is applicable to this okay so you know if you have a if you do an observation on the eicr and you say uh i know maybe you've got moisture ingress in an outside luminaire you know you can actually pick this up with that okay effects here mechanical damage includes impact stress strain Okay, stress, strain, abrasion, wear, vibration, hydraulic, and pneumatic pressure. Okay, 
stresses and strain, I've been doing some work lately and I'm seeing a lot of armors that have been overbent. I've been, you know, assessing how, you know, the actual strain that's on the gland itself and things like that. All of that is applicable. Effects of weather, short term or long term, such as temperature cycling effects. So, you know, um, long term weather, you could be thinking about, you know, soil freezing or even ground drying out with electrodes as well. That could be an, that could be an issue. And then, you know, you can think about short term. And we, are, we, I don't know about you down there, but we had a huge amount of rain thrown on us for about an hour and a half yesterday. We did. Yeah. Uh, you know, just a quick torrential downpour. Natural hazards, tides, trees, plants. Again, uh, solar radiation mentioned there. Temperature and pressure. Liquids, storing liquids. You may have humidity, condensation, flooding, splashing, immersion. Okay, again, if you think about BS7671, we know about these where we selection and erection, but this is mentioned here. So if you have an issue, you're looking at an issue with electricity at work regulation six. Mechanical damage. Okay weather and corrosive effects so there's lots of guidance um and yeah i'm not going to read all of this because we're just it's just noise uh ingress protection here internationally recognized system for classifying the degree of protection provided by enclosures against the ingress of solid or moisture okay the system is commonly known as the ip rating system is detailed in a number of standards all right, so it's acknowledging the IP ratings here as well. Always makes me laugh. That's never. It's not in the on-site guide or guidance note three. All the regs, the IP codes. I mean, they're in the regs in in a in a manner or form in Appendix five. But why don't they actually give you? You see these charts, don't you, and tables? Like they've got them in the code yes. of practice for electrical equipment testing. It's in yes. there. So why not put those in the on-site guide or the regs? It would make it so much easier for people. I think I think they just don't want to make things easy for electricians. Maybe I don't know. It does. Um, it does. It does. I mean, we often end up going to manufacturers for them, don't we? Code of, the fourth edition code of practice, the, the basically the pack testing book. It's mm. got it in there. You know, it's all nicely laid out at the table. Well, why not put that in the? I don't know. In the other guides, it's just nonsense. All right. So that was um, six, yep. seven is insulation protection and placing of conductors okay so conductors in a system which may give rise to danger shall either be suitably covered with insulating material and as necessary protected so as to prevent so far as we see practicable danger so there's so far as we see practicable mentioned here so suitably covered by insulating material or have such precautions taken in respect of them as will prevent so far as it's practical danger. So uh, such precautions could be what? Up out of reach. Up out of reach, yeah, yeah behind a barrier. So if your cable yeah. is not covered with a suitable insulated material, then other measures will be taken. So yeah. fundamentally, if you can touch it, then danger is there. So that's an immediate issue. So if you have a readily accessible live part, you've got no insulation, then you've got regulation seven. This is where we're looking at placing out of reach obstacles and that sort of stuff, which is for, you know, in, installations under the guise of uh, under the guidance of skilled and mm -hmm. supervised persons. Yeah. Okay. So the danger to be protected against generally arises from differences in electrical potential between circuit conductors or between such conductors and other conductors in a system. So you know, technically, if you're exposed to <coughs> 230 volts, 230 volts of the same phase, and you're not touching an earth reference, yeah, then potentially there's no risk there. But that's what this is saying. Is if you're exposed to differences of potential, which we know earth is its own potential, and any other life conductor, then that's a potential difference, isn't it? So the conventional approach is either to insulate the conductors or place them so people are unable to receive electric shock or burn from them some form of basic insulation or physical separation of conductors in a system is necessary for it to function that functional minimum however may not be sufficient to comply with the requirements of this regulation factors which must be taken into account are the nature and severity of the probable danger the functions to be performed by the equipment 
the location of the equipment, its environment and conditions to which it is objected, or any work which is likely to be done on or near it. So it's basically saying, you know, conductors may be insulated to accommodate their voltage, basically to, you know, to just trap the, uh, the current in that one conductor so it doesn't start leaking off anywhere else. And those conductors are rated to the voltage required flowing through those conductors. Now, depending on where you use them, select them, or if you work with them, it might be that there is a level of risk there that actually, you know, needs to be reassessed. Yeah. Uh, we talk about segregation of conductors, for example, of band one and band two circuits. We can easily risk having mechanical damage to a band two and a band one, and we can have some kind of issue with that. So we've got to make sure that we identify there is other risk there. And if it's insulated to its own voltage, make sure that these other considerations are met. Well, that would, that would include also then if you've got, uh, and we were talking about this the other day, we said about the fact that the, that uh, document that we're looking at says that the, ME, the MET of a system is very rarely at zero volts because of mm -hmm. fault currents and, and, and leakage currents and stuff like that. So if you've got um, a large event or system, yeah, which is actually fed by two different systems with two different earthing systems, um, and you've got two bits of equipment which end up very close to each other, so you've got simultaneous contact, the metal work of those two bits of equipment could actually be at different voltages. There could mm -hmm. be a slight difference in potential between the two. Yeah, yeah, true. Okay, so it talks about insulation here. It reminds us about 7671, only up to LV though, the upper limit of LV. Okay, other procedures including placing of these. Um, it permits the alternative of having such precautions taken in respect of the conductors. These particular uh, precautions may include a suitable placing of conductors that may compromise strictly controlled working practices, reinforced by measures such as written instructions, training, and warning notices. Um, so, yeah, um, railway electrification, cranes in factories, you know, so where you have exposed live parts uninsulated, but you're going to have them in very tightly controlled environments, and it's going to be lots of written structure instructions warning signs and they're going to be in environments that you can't just as a member of public walk into yeah so you know and that we place out of reach the majority of the time overhead lines is under the esqcr that's electricity safety quality continuity regulations which obviously regulates the uh, providers of supplies and distributors of systems Okay, uh, electrical, electric railway tramway operators in conjunction with the Office of Rail and Road have developed their own standards about the suitable selection, erection, and maintenance of their systems. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, last bit there is duty holders should carefully consider the inherent risk that may still exist if bare conductors are placed where they cannot normally be touched such as maintenance activities around the conductors of an overhead electric electric overhead crane system, for example. Yeah, so I had, um, I had an experience in a factory a couple of years ago where there were bus bar chambers that have partly been decommissioned, so they've been left opened up. And they're about, I don't know, about eight, eight meters up. And when I said, well, those are live and they're open, you've got to shut them up or lock them off. The guy in charge said, well, they're, they're up there, they're out of reach. And I was on site doing an EICR and I was on a MUP and I was authorized. So they said, well, you are. But whilst I was going around my MUP and doing the work, there were other people doing other work, putting in baskets, basically about half a meter beside this buzz bar. And they were putting in basket for fiber and data. So whilst you may think that placing out of reach is safe, other workers or other, you know, other, other work activities might go up there. Uh, painting, you know, you might use some painting or some cleaning or some fire or whatever. So if you see something that's overhead, if you see something that's live, if you th if they say, okay, it's placed out of reach, just make sure that other duties or other workers or other activities are considered and they should have pretty have some strategy where if you're going to work above a certain height, this is either powered down or those persons are actually authorized. And if they're authorized, the question is, how have they authorized that? How have they handed the control? Yeah, to the persons doing the work, and if they haven't got control of safety, it's 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 you know these are the areas that you can pick up with this. Right, I'm I'm going to have to shoot, mate. Um, You're going to shoot? Yeah. Um, about an hour and three quarters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Classic. Uh, but anyway, I shall shoot. Um, I, I don't know whether you're going to do the rest of this or whether you're going to. I'm just going to or whatever. But, I'm um, at eight now, so I'm going to skip through the last few. 
Okay, mate. All right. I'll, wait to, I'll talk to you later tonight, maybe. Yep. Talk to you later. Bye bye. All right. Okay. Take care, everybody. See you. I'll see you on. Right. <clears throat> when he clicks off. <laughs> there he goes. Oh, now he's gone. He can stop asking questions as well. So um, that's seven. Let's do eight. Eight is regulation eight earthing or other suitable precautions. So this is this is quite a long one here. So precautions are taken either by earthing or by other suitable means to prevent danger arising when any conductor, other than a circuit conductor, which we said earlier on was one that carries current, yeah, which may reasonably foreseeably become charged as a result of either the use of a system or a fault in the system becomes so charged and for the purpose of ensuring compliance with this regulation, the conductor shall be regarded as earthed when it is connected to the general mass of earth by conductors of sufficient strength and current carrying capability to discharge electrical energy to earth. Okay. What does it actually say though? Precautions will be taken either by earthing or by other suitable means to prevent danger when conductors, okay, which can really be foreseeably become charged. So, we're talking about, uh, you know, extraneous conductive parts. These are conductors that have a potential. We're talking about things that are not the live conductors. If they can rise to danger, then precautions will be taken to make sure that they do not create a danger. So if you have a situation where you have ineffective bonding, you have ineffective earthing of exposed conductive parts, they're not the circuit conductors themselves, but they can rise to a danger, then we have regulation eight. Okay, so if you have ineffective earthing or bonding, it's likely that you can go straight to regulation eight and use that one. Okay, so it applies to any conductor other than a circuit conductor, including the conductive parts of equipment, such as outer metallic casings, which can be touched and though not live, may become live under a fault. Okay, so you may have, uh, again, we verify that with maintenance. We verify that maintenance with patch testing. If you think about electrical equipment and the outer protective um, covers. Okay, we've covered dangers already. Okay, result of failure to the necessary precautions, including risk of shock from conductors which are, may or, which are or may be exposed, so they can be touched, or risk of burns, fire, or arcing due to excessive magnitude or duration of such conductors. Okay, and it may be met in several different ways, including ensuring conductors do not become charged. Such so conductors do not become charged to the values of voltage and current and the duration. Or if such conductors do, do become charged, the environment is such that danger will not arise. So we can have, if you think about this, an equipotential zone. The idea of having equipotential bonding is so that if they do become charged, the whole environment rises to that voltage. So if we have a fault, the duration of the fault, the whole environment rises to that level, and as there's no potential differences in that environment, the whole place yeah, does not create danger. Danger will not arise because the whole thing has risen to that potential fault. Techniques deployed to achieving this include double insulation, earthing, common voltage reference points, equipotential bonding, using safer voltages, okay, cell bell, for example, earth free non conducting environments, current energy limitation. Okay, separated or isolated systems. And you can apply any of those. There's obviously guides about double insulation and all of these things here and insulation and earthing here. But um, again, if you've covered BS7671, you will know how these operate to protect against electric shock. Um, it does say here the integrity of this safety protection will depend upon the layers of insulation remaining in sound condition. And this in turn requires the equipment to be properly constructed, used and maintained. So double insulation does need rigorous maintenance to be sure that the equipment is in sound condition. Other thing, we've got here single phase and three phase systems mentioned. This just talks about how Earthing is used for the potential uh, for the method of ADS, okay, uh, impedance of the fault loop, impedance of the fault itself. Um, again, um, have a good read of this. If you have an issue with earth fault loop impedances or protected devices being uh, working with your earth fault impedances, maybe they're not going to achieve disconnection, then you've got earthing as the problem here for re uh, regulation eight.
Okay, for the duration of the fault, the bonding of exposed conductive parts and their connection to earth services to, serves to limit the shock risk for the transient voltage appearing between the metal struck enclosures of equipment in the system. Current earthing therefore includes the bonding of metallic enclosures, cable armoring, conduits and trunking. These conductors are electrically continuous and securely connected to the general mass of earth at one or more points. So we've got to look at all of these parts here. Okay. And make sure they're all effectively connected to earth. So they're going to operate as required. Let's mention here about RCDs. Okay, accidents have been caused by metalwork of portable or transportable equipment becoming live as a result of the combined effects of fault and high impedances, okay, due to protective conductor connections. This can be reduced by the RCD of 30 milliamp. Okay, so we can use an RCD of 30 milliamp where we have higher impedances of the earth. Makes sense. We understand that. Bonding is the interconnection of all exposed and extraneous conductors, which may become electrically charged in such a way that dangerous voltages between any of the conductors that may be simultaneously touched are limited. That's a very nice definition of equipotential bonding, really. We can use reduced low voltages. So we have reduced low voltage itself, 110, which gives us a 55 uh, volt for single phase. We understand that. We have earth free environments which we can use, non-conducting environments. Current limitation, which we can use like with uh, IT systems and similar. Okay. <clears throat> Let me just look at a question just so I can kind of catch up here. Uh, Paul, regarding this used equipment, if you cannot remove the circuit conductors, don't you just connect them all to earth? Well, that, what that will do then is that will turn them from circuit conductors to, con, uh, to conductors, wouldn't it? That would change their use. So if we review that, they'll become, all right, so they'll become conductors in a system and not circuit conductors, right. Um, if the definition's okay with that, then that's, I, I think that is commonly the best action, isn't it? To connect them all to earth. Uh, you still may be exposed though to, what you'd have to do is assess if you're going to have any problem though with um, voltages being induced and capacitive coupling potentially still, if that's going to be a problem. Um, for example, what you'd want to do is uh, you can connect them to earth, but if they're in a wiring system with many other cables, you might find that you now have obviously some induced voltages and you might get those rising onto your earthing. And if you've got maybe an RCD or something on that earthing, that might start nuisance tripping. So you can put a clamp meter around the earth and just see if you've got any leakage current <clears throat> going through. All right, so we're going to go to nine. Regulation nine is integrity of a referenced conductor. So if the circuit conductor is connected to earth or to any other reference point, no, nothing which might reasonably be expected to give rise to danger, but breaking the electrical continuity or introducing high impedances shall be placed in that conductor unless suitable precautions are taken to prevent that danger. So what that means is <clears throat> the connections fundamentally of all of the circuit conductors, okay, will not introduce high impedances. So if you have any poor connections, yeah, then you've got a problem. Placing that conductor less two precautions to take to prevent danger. Yeah. So other precautions could be obviously current limiting scenarios or similar. So it talks here about the reference point of Earth, where it's from. It talks about the distribution of Earth. TNC, TNS, devices placed in the conductor. Regulation does not prohibit all devices from being placed in reference conductors, proper joint or bolted link or a bar primary current transformer, for example. Okay. We've just got to make sure they're well tested, well maintained, or you know, maybe even torque tested or greased up. Combine neutral and protective conductors to so pen conductors. 
open circuit of or high impedance in combined neutral and protected conductors will almost certainly result in exposed extraneous conductors connected to the protected conductors such as metal enclosures or switch gear being at a significant potential relative to earth and if you think about open open pen conductors this is the issue we're seeing with high resistance in a pen conductor lately we've been talking about that a lot with ev However, when the protected conductor is combined with the neutral conductor over some part of their length, you should take precautions to prevent people coming into simultaneous contact with the protected conductors and earth, equipotential bonding of all metal work within a building and the connection to this protected conductor or neutral is a commonly used approach. All right, a bit there about separate neutral and earths. Okay. And then this last bit here, in general, if a neutral conductor is to be switched, a multipole switch or circuit breaker should be used, which also switches all of the related phase conductors, the neutral breaking last and making first. That's exactly as it's also mentioned in BS7671. So this is about the integrity of these conductors. Connections themselves, 10, when necessary to prevent danger, every joint and connection in the system is to be mechanically and electrically suitable for use. Two words there, mechanically. So you've got to consider the things like uh, thermal cycling, vibration, impact. Yeah, and then you've got the electrical connection itself. It requires all connections in circuits and protected conductors, including connections to terminals, plugs, and sockets, and any other means of joining or connecting conductors to be suitable for the purpose for which they are used. So if you see a connection that's unsuitable, you can pull up this regulation, okay? And it does not say here where it reads to be practicable, so this is absolute as well. Mechanical protection and strength must be such as to ensure the integrity of the insulation and conductance under all conditions of use, including likely fault conditions, subject to the need for any maintenance which may be required by Regulation 4.2. 4.2 is about the need for maintenance to prevent danger. So if there is mechanical protection um, needed or the mechanical protection strength must be such to ensure the integrity of the insulation, there needs to be a way to safely maintain and assure that is constantly checked. Joints and connections in protective conductors must be made at least as carefully as those in circuit conductors, and they should be of sufficient strength and conductance to allow the passage of fault currents. It's uniquely worded there. So in the protective conductor, they must be made at least as carefully. Okay. So this is suggesting that obviously there's uh, maybe less workmanship or less uh, effort made. All right. So if you see, you know, if you see that there's a poor effort at earthing or the connection isn't as good, or as uh, solid or as firm, then this is stressing that they need to be just as well made because they are very important uh, connections, aren't they? They may, may need to be treated so that they prevent corrosion. It's recommended that combinations of metals liable to produce damaging electrolytic action be avoided. Yeah, uh, if you connect to similar metals, they need to be treated for that as well. Uh, plug and socket connections and their use must be arranged so that accidental contact with conductors live at dangerous voltages are prevented. So if we use suitable selected plugs and sockets, that shouldn't be a problem. In most applications, if a plug and socket type connector conveys a protective conductor as well as the circuit conductors, then the protective conductor should be the first to be made and the last to be separated. Okay, the use of the equipment made to the appropriate standard should ensure this principle is hid, it hit to. So yeah, so you think about a, a typical 13 amp plug, the protective conductor is inserted first. And when you extract it, it disconnects last. All right, so regulation 11, means for protecting against excess of current. Efficient means suitably located shall be provided for protection from excess of current for every part of the system as may be necessary to prevent danger. Okay, so we're talking about here overload protection. Faults and overloads may occur on systems. Regulation requires systems and parts of the system be protected against the effects of short circuits and overloads 
if these would result in currents which would otherwise result in a danger. This means protection is likely to be in the form of fuses or circuit breakers controlled by relays, etc., or it can be provided by some other means capable of interrupting the circuit or reducing it to a safer value, like a you know an IT system maybe. We need to consider of normal conditions, fault currents need to be accommodated, short circuits, etc. Making sure there's no consideration of uh, no uh, worry about mechanical damage to the cable. So a bit here about selection of excess current protection. In principle, every main circuit should be protected at its origin, at the source end of the circuit. If it forms a branch circuit, it's less than that of the conductors from which it is drawing power. It's a conventional for protection to be placed at this point as well. There are exceptions to this principle though. Mentioned here, when selecting the means of protection, we consider the nature of the circuits and the type of equipment to be protected, the short circuit current energy available in the supply, the nature of the environment, and whether the system is earthed or not. So those are some key things mentioned here for selection of devices there for overcurrent protection. We know about the maximum short circuit current it must be considered. The design of the protective arrangements must also be provided for sufficient current to be available to operate the protected devices correctly in respect of all likely faults. Uh, a little bit on defence and criminal proceedings for this one. The defence regulation is available for this. In some circumstances, it will be technically impossible to achieve total compliance with the absolute requirement to prevent danger. If an excess of current is drawn due to fault or overload, such as due to an arcing fault, then whatever form of electrical protection is provided, there will be some danger at the point of the fault current during the finite time taken for the detection and interruption of this. Nevertheless, electrical protection, whether by means of simple fuse or another method, must be properly chosen and installed in accordance with good electrical engineering practice. The protection must be efficient and effective. In some circumstances, it's undesirable to interrupt the current in a circuit because it may itself lead to a hazard. So circuits for safety services, exciting circuits, motors, uh, lifting magnets, etc., lifting electromagnetics there, where this is all in BS7671. The circuit should be rated or arranged so as not to give rise to danger from an excess of current, therefore. So we'd look at making sure it's suitable for that. So there's a little bit of defense on that one. 12 talks about cutting off the supply. Subject to paragraph three down here. When necessary to prevent danger, suitable means, including where appropriate methods of identifying circuits are to be available for cutting off the supply of energy to equipment and isolation of any equipment. In paragraph one here, isolation means the disconnection and separation of the equipment from every source of energy in such a way this disconnection and separation source is secure. So isolation means securely disconnecting the source of energy. Paragraph one is not to apply to equipment which itself is a source of energy, but in such a case is necessary, precautions shall be taken to prevent so far as is practical danger. So if your equipment itself is a source of energy, then you obviously cannot remove it. Okay, so just so this is to assure where necessary to prevent danger, suitable means are available to switch off the supply to any piece of equipment Switching can be, for example, by direct manual operation or by indirect operation via a stop button. There may be a need to switch off equipment for reasons other than preventing electric danger, but these considerations are outside of the scope. Okay, whereas regulation 1218 requires means to be provide whereby the supply of energy can be switched off, 121B requires that will be available suitable means for ensuring the supply will remain switched off and an inadvertent reconnection prevented. This isolation, okay, this is isolation. 
This provision in conjunction with safe working practices will enable work to be carried out on electrical equipment without the risk of becoming live during the course of that work. For example, if work is to be done under terms of regulation 13. In some cases, equipment used to perform the requirement under this regulation may also serve to perform the requirement under 121B. So sometimes the device that actually turns it off, that switches it off, and will also isolate, okay? But they are not necessarily the same. You know, in some circumstances, they are to perform the same action or by the same equipment. So there's a difference between switching it off and isolating it. Isolation is where it cannot inadvertently be reconnected. Okay, that's isolation. So that's why we say switch off, lock off. All right. We see where necessary to prevent danger. The needs for means to cut off the supply and affect isolation it depends on factors such as likely danger in normal and abnormal conditions. This is maybe influenced by environmental conditions and provisions to be made in case of emergencies such as fire in premises, includes consideration of which electrical equipment could be a source of danger if such means were not provided and installation commissioning operational maintenance requirements over the life of the equipment. So when necessary to prevent danger, abbreviates to that. All right, sewer means of isolation will have the capability to positively establish an air gap. This is like I um, mentioned a lot when I say about suitable isolators, they must have sufficient separation, sufficient clearance of the contacts, okay? Or other effective dielectric, which together with adequate creepage and clearance distances will ensure that there is no likely way in which the isolation gap will fail electrically. Include a necessary means to directed at, uh, means directed at preventing unauthorized interference with or improper operation of the equipment, so locking it off. Be located to be accessible and ease with which may be employed is appropriate for the application. Time and effort must be expended to effect isolation. It should be reasonable, so it shouldn't be so hard or so uh, laborious that it's obviously disregarded. Be clearly marked to show which equipment it relates to, unless there could be no doubt, and only be common to several items of equipment where it's appropriate for these to be isolated as a group. So you've got one isolator that kicks off three motors, and you do that if it's acceptable at all times. Because if you can't turn off one motor, then people might ignore effective isolation to work on another. You know, just individual isolation is best. Right, regulation 13, precautions for work on equipment to be made dead. Adequate precautions shall be taken to prevent electrical equipment which has been made dead in order to prevent danger while work is carried out on or near that equipment from becoming electrically charged during that work if danger may thereby arise. So we're gonna take precautions to prevent equipment which has been made dead to becoming live while work's being carried out. So how do we do that? Well, we've just talked about isolation and locking off, okay? This may apply during any work, but it, electrical or non-electrical, non-electrical, so it could be mechanical, could be cleaning, could be hygiene process. Okay. These precautions must be effective in preventing the equipment from becoming charged in any way which would give rise to danger. These precautions will prevent the equipment from becoming charged by connection to its own or normal sources of energy that may not alone be sufficient to prevent charging. Presence of electrical energy as a result of electromagnetic induction, mutual capacitance or stored electrical energy may have to be guarded against by applying earth connections or additional earth connections for the duration of the work. Where work is to be done on or near these conductors and they have to be isolated, the conductors must be proved dead at the point of work before the task starts. Proved dead at the point of work. Okay, that's something that um, I have to highlight a lot when I do isolation training because we put, you know, prove, we, we turn off, we switch off, we prove it dead, but then we go to work and there could obviously be a circuit that's picking up a supply from somewhere else. And so we always test for dead at the point of work. If a test 
instrument or voltage indicator is used for its purpose, it should itself be proved, preferably immediately before, immediately after testing. So proof, test, proof. This regulation does not prevent the application of a test voltage to equipment, provided this does not give rise to danger. Okay, it then talks here about written procedures, so systems of work, safe isolation procedures of formalized and written instructions and safety document including permits to work may form part of this process. And decommissioned equipment, before equipment is decommissioned, dismantled or abandoned for any reason, it must be disconnected from all sources of supply and effective steps taken to ensure it's dead and can inadvertently become re-energized or dangerously charged. Okay, so um, with regards to that, Paul says, where we work, all conductors in the trucking have to be isolated before anyone is allowed to take the lid off and start work. And it's a good process because if you turn off a circuit, and you've got one circuit going into trunking with 12 other circuits. If you go into trunking and those other 12 circuits are charged, then when you start moving those cables, you're manipulating energized conductors. So a couple of things really, there could be damage in the trunking to the cable and they could obviously then short out. Or as you manipulate, those could actually move the connections in the board itself, which could then make them loose, which can then short out as well. So if you manipulate cables, they shouldn't be energized because you're going to put them under unnecessary and unpredicted mechanical stresses. Regulation 14, work on or near life conductors. Okay, regulation 14 here, the white box. No person shall be engaged in any work activity on or so near any live conductor other than one suitably covered by insulating material so as to prevent danger. The danger may arise unless three things. It's unreasonable in all the circumstances for it to be dead. So when I've done thermal imaging, for example, I A, need the equipment to be under some degree of load to obviously create the thermal uh, effects on the cables I'm trying to identify with the camera. Um, there are other methods such as thermal imaging windows, which are special windows you can mount onto switch gears and panels. But unless the client's got them already, I can't suddenly say oh we need to have them installed first because that's a huge engineering expenditure okay to go around and put windows for every single panel um i can recommend it for future modifications it's unreasonable in all the circumstances for him to be at work on or near it while it is live now let's remember that this applies to employees and employers and so if i'm at work and i'm going to take a panel open i might be authorized to do that I might be competent, I might have all the PPE, but I'm at someone's place of work and they're walking around and unless there's sufficient signage, barriers, guards or accompaniment to keep them from coming, I can't do this work because they might just walk right up. Because I'm in their area, I might be right in the place where they normally walk to or walk past. Yeah. Um, you know, just recently I was in, in an area in a large in a large uh, factory, and we were at the switch gear on the wall, but the switch gear wasn't caged off. The switch gear wasn't in a room; it was just on the wall in the factory. And so we've got ourselves kind of like cordoned off. But right as we're doing the work, you know, the cleaners are walking right up to the edge of our work boundary, getting their bits and moving around. They're 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 observing what we're doing, but they're not really thinking it's anything to do with them. So we have to obviously put in the physical barriers and the physical guards to protect them because they can't really identify the risk if they're not competent to identify the risk. They can read signage, and that's why we have to make sure the signage is good for them to read. They can see barriers, and hopefully they know not to push barriers, but that's any general health and safety kind of training. The electrical discipline is up to us to control, so we can't expect them to know that this is dangerous. Okay, so when you look at this second part, it's unreasonable for him to be at work on or near it while it's live. When you open up chambers or you do any live work, make sure you think about other persons who may be near you or near your work who also, you know, are live working if you don't consider them. All right, so what you need to do is board them off or get rid of them. And then suitable precautions are taken, including when necessary, the provision of suitable PPE. To prevent danger so it's unreasonable to work dead it's reasonable for you to be there so you have to take suitable precautions okay 
This addresses the situation where either permanently or temporarily danger from conductors is not prevented by the precautions specified back in Regulation 7. Okay. It's concerned only with those situations where people are at work on or near live conductors, which may foreseeably give rise to a danger. Such work is permitted only if conditions A, B, and C are satisfied. Work is not confined to electrical work, but includes any work activity, such as electrical testing. All right, so there's a bit on the need for the conductor to be live, okay? If danger may otherwise arise, it's always preferable to work on an equipment should be carried out when that equipment is dead. Regulation 14 recognizes that there are circumstances, however, if it's unreasonable, having regard to all relevant factors for the equipment to be dead while work proceeds. An example of this might be undertaking maintenance, checks or repairs on a busy section of electric railway track where it would be disproportionately disruptive and costly for the live conductor to be isolated for the period of the work. All right, so it's scalable. Okay, if, if, if you're told you can't turn it off because someone doesn't want to shut down or save their work, then that's obviously probably not reasonably practicable. Um, but if you're talking, as the example here says, about shutting down a railway or something to a much larger proportion, maybe you're going to turn off data in a server or something, then there could be a big problem with that. So it's, you know, it's got to be scalable, but it's got to be, uh, it's got to make sense. Remember it said earlier on, about reasonably practicable and that, you know, a little bit of insulation is, is okay. So that shouldn't be a problem. You've got to consider the scale of the, why you're working live. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, need to be live. When ordering, posting, installing plant and consider the manner of operation, maintenance, repairs, equipment, which will be necessary during its life. So this is saying when you're ordering, purchasing, or installing plant, consider trying to, Think about live, it, maybe you can buy plant, buy switch gear, buy control gear. It doesn't need you to actually do certain work live because maybe you can do it dead or maybe you can do other work in another part, depending on the work that you're doing. Okay, equipment which combines power and control circuitry should be arranged so that the power circuits are physically separate and segregated from logic and control circuits, also placed, recessed, or otherwise arranged. The risk of accidental contact is eliminated. Same applies to panels with uh, mechanical and air. They're really supposed to be completely segregated from each other now. You shouldn't really be exposed to a risk of mechanical machinery if you're working with electrical safety in mind. Similarly, if you're working with mechanical machinery, you shouldn't be worried about being exposed to live parts. So, you know, you'll see companies now will be adding extra insulation and barriers to live parts in their panels because when the guy does work on the air or the mechanical he shouldn't be exposed to the risk of the electrical some older panels just won't be up to date yet though so you've always got to be a bit aware of that live work includes live testing for example the use of a potential indicator on mains power and control logic circuits Okay, factors which should be considered in deciding whether it was justifiable for work to be perceived with conductors live. It's not practical to carry out the work with the conductors dead. For the purpose of testing, it's necessary for the conductors to be live. So live testing does require the circuit conductors to not be dead. Remember what Phil said earlier on though? So if I'm gonna to have to do some live work for the live tests, it doesn't mean I have to do all of the work live and I can have maybe the dead tests done first, yeah? And a lot of guys fail the AM2 because of this, because they'll have a panel open and they'll do some live tests and then they'll move on to do something else. So they'll verify a live test. And when they do the next thing, the first thing they didn't do was put the cover back or remove the risk. Okay, always have the risk exposed for the minimum extent that you need it to. Making conductors dead will create other hazards. Okay, it could be operating plant processes, could be uh, safe, um, safe operating systems. Other statutory requirements and level of risk involved in working live and the effectiveness of the precautions available set against the economic need to perform the work. Okay. Um, need, to, that's fine. Uh, need to be take precautions to prevent injury. System of work, okay, safe system of work. Allow only people who are competent to do the work. We'll look at that in a minute in Regulation 16. Indicate within what limits the work is to be attempted. 
indicate what levels of competence apply to each category of such work, incorporate procedures under which the person attempting the work will report back if the limits specified in the system are likely to be exceeded. This usually requires detailed planning before the work is started. I said earlier on about doing a bit by bit process. Civil so recourse should include the use of people who are properly trained and competent to work on live systems. Provision of adequate information to the person carrying out the work about the live conductors involved, the associated electrical system and the foreseeable risks. That way they can understand levels of energy yeah, and the actual full current levels that they're going to they're going to potentially um, not see, but may occur. Suitable tools, insulated tools, equipment, protective clothing, etc. All of this is suitable precautions. Okay. Insulated barriers, instruments, accompaniment by other persons, restriction of routine live work, and effective control of any other area uh, if there's a danger from live conductors. There's a mention of accompaniment. Okay. A duty holder's judgment as to whether someone carrying out work subject to Regulation 14 should be accompanied should be based on considerations of how injury is to be prevented. If an accompanying person can substantially contribute towards the implementation of safe work in practice, then they should be present. They should be trained to recognize danger, and if necessary, render assistance to the event of an emergency. So the accompanying person should have some level of um, risk management control, uh, I don't know, uh, being able to maybe even carry out first aid as well. Control of the area, testing, okay. And then we have suitable protective equipment. So the control of the area, we'll just talk about obviously signage and barriers, okay. If there's a danger from live conductors to ensure that those who are not competent to prevent the occurrence of injury and those whose presence is unnecessary, they're not permitted in the area. If the person undertaking the work is continuously present while the danger exists from the live conductors and the area is small enough to be under their constant supervision, then further precautions to control access may not be necessary. So you might not need to get signage and barriers if you're basically in a little small area and you're fully aware of the people around you and there's not a lot of people. Okay. If, however, it's too large or they're not continuously present, then effective control should be secured by other means, such as lockable enclosures, barriers, warning notices, or a combination of those. The testing, Regulation 14 will apply often to testing. Testing to establish whether equipment conductors are live or dead is always to be done on the assumption that they are live. So technically, proving dead must be done on the assumption that it is live. Therefore, it should be assumed that this regulation is applicable until such time as conductors have been proved dead. So to prove something dead, you have to start the work live. So if you go to a site, you go, oh, we're not going to work live. And you go, great. Well, the first thing we're going to do is prove dead. That's working live because that's under this regulation, okay? So you have to approach it with a suitable system in place just in case it is live, but no increased level of danger has now been created, okay, by complying with regulation 14. When testing for confirmation of a dead circuit, the instrument or voltage indicator used for this purpose must itself be proved, preferably immediately before or immediately after the test. Although the live test might be justifiable, it does not follow that there will be necessary justification for any subsequent repair work to be carried out live. So again, if you've done live testing, you found a problem, the remedy might not be necessarily done live. If it doesn't have to be done live, then don't do it live. Again, minimize the extent of the live work. Sort of protective equipment is mentioned here, kind of like as a last resort, because this is assuming everything else hasn't worked. Okay, so suitable clothing, insulating helmets, goggles, gloves. Consider the risks for screening against shock, uh, short circuits, and things like that. You should consider placing notices or place cards or placards giving details of emergency resuscitation procedures. Many switch rooms should already have them. Okay, I've got one in my car which I carry around just in case I'm in an environment where there isn't one present. Okay, so that's Regulation 14. 
Regulation 15. I do pick up a lot, especially on EICRs. And this is for the purpose of enabling injury to be prevented. Adequate working space, yeah? Adequate working space. Now you think about what that means. Does adequate working space means that you can actually still physically do the work? Or does adequate working space mean that you can safely stand back if you need to and observe the work and not work like some kind of stupid T-Rex? Okay. Adequate working space should mean that you have free movement and if areas get confined where you have to i don't know you're in a cramped location and you're doing live work or you're trying to prove isolation and suddenly you're unable to properly grip the instrument properly see the terminals you're holding a torch at a stupid angle or you've got some kind of magnet torch or whatever if the work is awkward and it's not easy to carry out then this working space is very inadequate means of access Lighting is to be provided at all equipment on which or near work is being done in circumstances which may give rise to danger. So if you go into a control panel or a switch room, there's no lighting or the lighting doesn't work, you should have a lantern or something provided for you just in case. You should have sufficient space, access and adequate illumination provided while people are working on at or near equipment so that they may work safely. Okay. The regulation does not require such space, access, or illumination to be provided at times other than work is being done. So you know, it hasn't got to be there at all times, only there when the work is necessary. Working space. Where there are dangerous, exposed, live conductors within reach, the working space dimensions should be adequate. To allow people to pull back away from the conductors without hazard. To allow people to pass one another with ease and without hazard. Natural light is preferable to artificial light. Where artificial light is necessary, it's preferable that this is from a permanent and properly designed installation, indoor switch rooms, etc. There will always be exceptions and special circumstances where these principles cannot be achieved, such as where hand lamps or torches may be the sole or most important means of lighting. Whatever level of lighting is used, it must be adequate to enable injury to be prevented. So you should never sustain an injury and the result being poor lighting or you didn't see it. Regulation 16 is competence. No person is to be engaged in any work activity where technical knowledge or experience is necessary to prevent danger or where appropriate injury unless he possesses such knowledge or experience or is under such a degree of supervision as may be appropriate have regard to the nature of the work. We talk about this one a lot because we talk about competence. No one can apparently define competence but it's here people say what's competence what's a competent person the competence is here okay fundamentally all right you have to have technical knowledge experience okay and people will say oh i'm fully qualified i'm qualified da, da, da. it must be for the nature of the work okay so if if you know that the work's going to be tomorrow and you've got the good knowledge, you've got the good experience for it, then yes, you're competent, okay? As long as you can prevent danger and where appropriate injury, okay? Alternatively, you can be under such a degree of supervision to achieve the same thing. So the competence, <coughs> you have to have knowledge and experience, okay? It says knowledge or experience is necessary. It means both, doesn't it? Always remember, it's relative to the nature of the work. I have to highlight that again and again and again because people will just question competence. This regulation uses both terms injury and danger and therefore applies to all work associated with the equipment where danger may arise and whether or not danger or the risk of injury is actually present during the work. It would include situations where the elimination of the risk of injury, i.e. the prevention of danger, for the duration of the work is under the control of someone who must therefore possess sufficient technical knowledge or experience or be so supervised to be capable of ensuring that danger is prevented. For example, where a person is to isolate some equipment before undertaking work on the equipment, they require sufficient technical knowledge or experience to prevent danger during this isolation. There'll be no danger from the equipment during the work Right, the isolation has been carried out properly, danger will have been prevented. 
So we've removed danger by achieving isolation. However, the person doing the work must have sufficient technical knowledge or experience so as to prevent danger during the work, for example, by not knowing, for example, by knowing not to work on adjacent live circuits. So if you've disconnected one circuit, they need to know not to work on other circuits. So this is, could be, for example, this could be you isolating a circuit, proving it isolated, doing the live work, proving it isolated, then you can send your apprentice to do some work on that circuit. But if they're going to do work on a circuit in a board, there are adjacent live circuits. Okay, So you're probably not going to allow them to do that work until they've achieved a higher level of competence. If they're going to do work on circuits which don't have adjacent circuits or other live conductors, then obviously there's less danger there. Technical knowledge or experience. The scope of technical knowledge or experience should include adequate knowledge of electricity, adequate experience in electrical work to be carried out, adequate understanding of the system to be worked on, and practical experience of that class of system. So a couple of key things here. Okay. Adequate understanding of the system to be worked on and practical experience of that class of system. Classes of system, different wiring system types. Yeah. So there should be practical experience of that class of system. So when we talk about people who have obviously not got much experience, this is where they can struggle to achieve what we'd recognize as competence, because how do we get evidence of practical experience of the specific class of system that you're working on? Must understand the hazards which may arise during the work and the precautions which need to be taken. If you do not understand the hazards which can come out as a result of your work, then you are not a competent person. Because how can you control danger, control the risk of injury if you can't identify the hazards? Yeah, and twisting that around, it means the ability to recognize at all times whether it's safe for work to continue, which basically means the ability to recognize at all times when suddenly you've got to stop work because you can prevent danger, because you can identify hazards. Yeah, when things go wrong and there's a, an issue or someone gets electric shock, the investigators will look for this control. And if they can prove that the control or the authorization of the work landed down onto the electrician, they'll then look at the electrician's approach and they'll identify this. As long as they can see the electrician's worked on that class of system before, that means the employer's given them the right kind of work. As long as they can see that the electrician's got all of that background, they can then try to look further into understanding how this happened. And quite often, it would then be due to um, the electrician himself. Okay, a um, bit of mention of supervision there. In some circumstances, people will require some degree of supervision where they do not have sufficient technical knowledge because we've got to develop knowledge. We've got to develop experience. We can't just instantly get it. So we've got to develop, and so we've got to have supervision first of all. Duty holders, when allocating to supervisors responsibilities for supervision, will clearly state to the supervisor exactly what their responsibilities are and consider stating these responsibilities in writing. Now, this is a key thing here, because when I get involved with companies, they go, oh, we want someone to be able to do this, but he can't do that. We have what's called a roles and responsibilities infrastructure. So we go, okay, who's the duty holder? Who's the person responsible? Who's the senior person? Who's the senior person responsible? Who's the responsible person? Who's the competent person? And we find all the individuals in a business and we go, right, what do you want them to do? And if they want them to access switch rooms, we see if they have sufficient experience and sufficient knowledge to do that safely. Okay. If they haven't, then they don't get the authorization. And if they do, they get the authorization and then they monitor it. So writing down authorizations, writing down responsibilities in writing, it's a very common, common thing these days. If the risks involved are low, the verbal instructions are likely to be adequate, but as the risk or complexity increases, it comes a point where the need for written procedures becomes important if instructions are to be understood and supervised more rigorously. So again, it's down to the frequency of the work, the scale, um, and how often people do it. And if you've got, for example, a type of work and you've got a number of contractors that you want to do that work, you want to write your own procedure, your own system, your own process. You know, other system companies writing their own process, then contractors can then read their own process and try to work to the same standard. That's, that's the intention there. Okay, um, 
Now, regulations 17 to 28 aren't covered here because these are revoked by the Mines Regulation 2014. And that just brings us to the one that we're going to finish on, which is Regulation 29 Defence, which we've been mentioning. It says, in any proceedings for an offence consisting of a contravention of regulations 4, 4, 5, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, or 16, it shall be a defence for any person to prove that he took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid the commission of that offence. Okay, so if you can get evidence, this, this guidance document is a great way of doing that, that you've complied with the requirements of these regulations, that is your defense. Okay. This only applies in criminal proceedings. It provides a defense for a duty holder who can establish that they took all reasonable steps and exercised all due diligence to avoid committing an offense under these regulations. Uh, and that just brings us to exemption certificates about who it doesn't apply to um, and other bits that we don't really need to cover right now about working outside of Great Britain. But yeah, so you'll see people mention defense a lot. And what that basically means is, right, get HSR 25, read these regulations, read the guidance, and make sure that the work is working to those requirements, all these regulations. And if you're not, then that's your, that's your defense gone. Okay, so to summarize, HSR 25, National Network Regulations, gives us good, you know, quite exhaustive guidance on all of these regulations here, which are statutory. Okay, the white box is the regulation. Let me just show you again. Okay, the white box is the regulation itself. That's the statutory bit. The blue box is the HSC guidance, which is obviously guidance, but is a great tool. And you can print this out and you can deliver this to supplement your EICRs to help the clients understand more strongly how important uh, you know they they you know the uh, EICR is if you give them some quotes of the legislative work regulations to go with it. So we've briefly covered regulation one, citation and commencement. So what the document is called, interpretation. So definitions there, who it applies to, employers, self-employed, and employees. Systems, work activities, and protective equipment. We talked about systems, the need to maintain them, the need to maintain them safely, and the need for equipment to actually uh, achieve safe working as well. Strength and capability of equipment was in five. Adverse or hazardous environments was in six. So if you've got, uh, uh, you know, you've got a, a risk of impact or a, a site that's outside with a poor IP rating. Installation, protection, and place of conductors is in seven. Okay, insulation integrity. Okay, erection of wiring systems. Earthing or other suitable precautions is eight. So if you've got ineffective earthing, if you've got extrusive conductive parts that aren't bonded, then you're looking at eight. Integrity of the reference conductors. Okay, so the actual continuity of them. They have the earth connections and not having high impedances, high impedance switches in there. Connections themselves is 10. So if you've got poor connection or insufficient connection for mechanical and electrical, Excess of current, overcurrent protection is 11. Current supply off for isolation, so a proper, isola a proper switching device that achieves sufficient clearance of the, of the uh, conductors and the need to secure them so they cannot inadvertently be turned back on is isolation. Then 13 is work on equipment made dead. Remember that it's not dead till proven dead, and to prove it dead, that bit's live. Yeah work on or near live okay you have to do it yeah so it's not practical to turn it off you need to be near it okay so if you do the work not near it then don't go near it and then suitable precautions are taken workspace access and lighting okay for yourself and someone else to pass so you're not squeezing up into panels you can safely stay at a distance from them Lighting that the lighting is ideally natural light, but if there is artificial light that it's you know it's for the task and it's giving you sufficient light. Alternatively, you've got lights or hands or hand lamps and things, but ideally you want something that is hands-free, so you have the hands to do that. You don't want to be holding a torch whilst also working. Uh, you can get these like magnet lights and things these days. And then competence. 
okay competence must have technical knowledge and experience it says or experience but it's both isn't it okay to prevent danger and the key things from that was relative to the nature of the work so think about the work you're going to do and identify you've got sufficient experience and knowledge in there if you are lacking then you need to seek some support some yeah, and get some instruction on that and then we finish with defense which just told us about a number of these regulations, four, four, five, six, seven, all the way through to here. If you can comply with these, or you can prove you've done all reasonable steps to comply with these, then 29 is your defense on that. And if anything has gone wrong and you can prove that you actually showed all efforts to comply, then that's your defense. Okay, so this was actually a bit of a lengthy overview, uh, although to be honest, I've done like day courses on this subject, so because there's a lot to talk about. Um, but have a thing about when you do EICRs is if you could use reference to literacy aware regulations with your codes to help your clients understand that actually, you know, this is a statutory issue right now. Yeah. It allows them to see more in the value of your code and it allows them to see more value in what, in what you're doing for them. Cause you're, you know, they want, they want you to give them value, um, and try and give them that. Let me just look at some questions here. Gary says, would installation resistance as a system dead still be considered as live working? Uh, <clears throat> I think we covered that during, yeah, because an installation resistance tester has batteries in, it's a source of energy, okay? Remember, the electricity at work regulations scope was total because we have things like torches and things that can create little um, ignitions in explosive environments and things. So it was, the scope was total, and it, I can't remember where it was. So even if you're a battery power, okay, if you're a battery power, you can um, have risk of ignition. And the same thing with insulation resistance tester. An insulation resistance tester is a source of energy. Batteries create 500 volts. It's a safe current. It's a safe current, but the voltage does create a response. And if you're on the end of that response, anyone been megahertz, you know what I mean that may have a secondary effect that could be harmful. So an installation resistance test, it's like what you're doing is really, you're going into a system, which maybe you've turned off, you're, you're holding a system in your hand. You've got a generator in your hand and you're about to connect to that generator. We mentioned this earlier on when you're connecting another generator as a parallel, you're about to connect that generator to the circuit conductors of the other system. So it has to be considered as live working. And until they rewrite this a different way, that's how we have to consider it. Right. <clears throat> Chris, given the regulation 16 states that the persons engaged in electrical work should be technically knowledgeable or experienced to prevent danger. Where does that legally place approved schemes, short course trained providers, qualified supervisors and duty holders who deem you competent in such tasks, given that the person engaging in such work beyond their knowledge can rely on 20 rely on 29 regulation upon produce certification and the like. Oh, yeah. Um, it's a complete cop out, isn't it? Uh, they could just rely on that. Um, I c all these, all these, all these strategies that say you're competent now, you're competent now. Um, they're only relative to the observation that they've made. So if the NIC come or NAPE or whoever come and see you in a home and they're going to look at you do a fuse board and they're going to award you competence to care and working. It's only with what they've observed as an instructor, you know, and you being an instructed person for that observation, and that's you in a home. If you now go, right, I'm going to do EV next week, technically, although they've awarded you competence, but they've not verified your competence to do that. So it is, and it's just a cop-out, and it's something that they, they're, not, they're not structured in the right way to properly assess your competence. Because to properly assess your competence, what you need to do is you need to say to them, next week I'm going to work on a caravan site. They then are going to go, oh, okay, when did he last work on a caravan site? Oh, he's never been on a caravan site. There's an immediate gap in competence that they've got to now fill. Yeah. However, if you start to collect your CPD and you start to actually collect your work history, oh, I did a caravan site back in 2017, and I'm about to work on a caravan site, you can prove your competence. Okay. Unfortunately, I, mean, I could talk for hours about these schemes and these other providers and stuff. It's all about authorization to work. So they're holding, they're holding the, 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 the carrot for you to get work 
and they're putting some crappy assessment that apparently authorizes and approves competence in the way. Um, so it doesn't, it doesn't work. Uh, I could, I've, and this is again why I don't get too involved with these organizations because I could prove their assessment strategy to be flawed within minutes because I can ask the right questions because I can pull this document plus three or four apart and I can go, well, have you done that and have you done that? And it'll just show gaps in their system because it's not effectively monitoring and approving you competent. And remember, the persons who need to prove you competent is yourself. Don't rely on other organizations to award you competence, to prove you competence. Ask yourself what work you want to do next week, what work you want to do in six months, and say to yourself, right, should I now start to develop some competence? We've been talking about smart homes lately, about prosumer installations, and we're starting to develop our competence now, technically, and we're trying to get some performance competence as well. And that's going to be everybody in a few years' time. So start now, start looking at what you want to do in the future, start getting technical competence. And then when you get opportunities, try to develop some experience in that. Okay, uh, Paul says, pulling PVC singles through or taking them out of a trunk and containing other singles that are live, would you class this as live work? It would be because you are potentially, well, whilst you're handling dead cables, you are potentially manipulating live cables. The question here, Paul, really, is how much impact are you making on energized cables? And also, are you at the place where they terminate or near them? Or if those are in contact with an earth? If you're gonna manipulate energized conductors, then the vibration on those may then create mechanical strain on a connection, which might then create a short, you know, might come out and touch earth or something. It's 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 really a case of how much movement you create on that. If you go in a board and you start moving things around, don't be surprised if a conductor, you know, pops out. Now, if it's a if it's a load circuit, it's probably not a problem. It's just going to turn off a circuit. If it's a supply cable, however, bigger problem. Um, so it really does depend on the work itself. It, you can't really just say yes, it's live. No, it's not live. It really depends on the risk that the work you're doing then creates. And this is why your system of work should always be dynamic to every individual work activity. Yeah. The, the trunking might be in a different condition at one site and the next. So have a look at the existing condition of the trunking as well. Okay. But I would always, if, if, if there is, if there is a lack of, um, lack of confidence, then assume it to be live because then you're going to seek approval to de-energize. Then if it does go wrong or if there is an issue and whilst you're pulling it, you, you know, this live cable that is now dead comes out, you've, you've protected from that potential risk. If you can be assured that there's going to be no risk of movement, impact or vibration on those cables and they are going to stay put, then maybe you can control it to be dead work. Okay. Completely depends on your understanding of what risk there is from your work. And do remember, if you're going to do the work or you're going to let your guys do work, make sure that you understand how they work, how they kind of, um, you know, how, 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 how gentle they are with pulling cables through trunking. Things like um, these, um, these, these, these super rod things and stuff, they're great tools. They get us out of really good, you know, really hard spots sometimes, but we can easily just try to push it too far with strapping cables and putting long lengths through. So do just observe how, how delicate they're being. Um, and if they're not being delicate enough and just escalate it to live work, then you, you can control the risk. <clears throat> Where we work, all conducts the trunking have to be isolated before anyone is allowed to take the lid off and start work. I, I read that one out earlier. I, I can understand that. I can understand that. It's, uh, they're stored, you know, those, those conductors, you know, they're, they're under load and you can have, you can have, I don't know, let's say for example, you've got a guy who's put in a, a, I don't know, a mushroom screw or something, and he's got a little bit of a screw that's pushed into a cable. You then pull a cable through, and then it scratches along a sharp bit of swarf that's not been trimmed off or something. Yeah, you drill in, and you don't you don't file that point, and you pull the cable along, it scratches in. That can then energize that system. Yeah. Um, subsequently, if you install a new circuit, you might do an IR test afterwards, and if you did that during that, you might find that before you then energize the circuit. So it. It is safer to do that. It's just a case of, um, you know, understanding that, that risk, really. Um, Paul, you broke my record. I did, apparently. Yeah. Um, well, it, it, maybe I should have done this in two parts. Maybe I'll do it again in two parts. Who knows? So I can go a bit slower. Um, so it's a lot to talk about. 
Okay, uh, I'm going to look at the chat. And then I'm going to, actually, I'll just put the chat here. No. Uh, da, 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 got some... Our Flash webinar would be interesting. Okay, well, I'll. Um, the pro problem with Art Flash is a bit like the problem I've just had with this is time. I might have to make it a couple to kind of like. Because it's just it's long. It's long. Okay. Am I still minds when used as a tourist attraction? Um, I'd assume I'd assume the work would be different. I'd assume that the use of electric electricity would be different than if it was a mine. If a mine was a mine, um, I would assume no. I'd assume no. But assuming is a bad word for me to say right now. So I'd have to look into that further, Mark. You know, I mean, the, the regulations for mines are specifically because of the working conditions in the mines, aren't they? So, no. Good question. So, you guys have had to go. Yeah, I mean, Phil said to me he's got to go soon. So, maybe we have to. <laughs> Paul says, keep going. All right. Okay. All right, so if you have a circuit with a PFC of, say, 600 abs, do you do the thermal withstand calc to check the cable can take it? What about the switches? Uh, again, um, all switches, all contacts, all devices will have some level of tolerance, voltage tolerance and current tolerance if they're designed to make and break. Um, just look at the manufacturer specs. Yeah. Sufficient current to operate a protected device. High impedance force might be an example. Yeah, high impedance force. We saw it. We saw that one. Um, yeah, that regulation about the, the integrity of the reference conductors. Uh, impedances can be a problem because obviously they they create issues with disconnections. Okie dokie. Um, thanks. Yeah, sure. Thanks for another short one. Uh, Section 212, second person should have CPR training. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to say, let's call this, let's call this a day. Um, let's, uh, let's just, let's just one day hope, hope that a 45 minute webinar is actually a, a possibility with this. Um, <clears throat> who knows? I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a webinar on the, um, on the, 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 the the, um, the 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 uses and construction physics of this thing, and I can guarantee you, I could not talk about that thing for more than forty five minutes. I'm sure. Okay. All right. Um, I apologise. This dragged on, guys. I will try to. Um, I'll upload this maybe, but I'll try to to do something a bit slower paced. Uh, normally this is a day course and I've tried to ram it. If there's the key message, key message here is get the legislation document, which I uh, showed you guys earlier on. Download it and send it to your clients and stuff. You know, that's there. Yeah. This obviously includes the bit in the middle about mines, I believe, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16. Then there's the part three here, regulation applying to mines only, which we've skipped. All right, so up to 16 is what we've covered. We've covered these regulations here. But these are, this is nice and quick. This would have been quicker, okay? Because this is just the regulations themselves. If you just want the regulations themselves, this is here. And then obviously get a hold of HSR 25. Then HSR 25 gives you this well well, it's quite exhaustive guidance for it. All right. Um, if you have any questions on it or anything, just send me a message. Uh, if you want to, you know, probably best go and have a break, but then download it, have a good read of it and think about how many times you do a code in EIC or anything and how, how much of that can be referenced to some of these legislations. Read the guidance first and you go, well, that's like that. And then that guidance will support that specific regulation. And then you can say to your clients, okay, 
but this statutory regulation actually is also uh, not complied with and it's an absolute regulation that gives your clients much more information and understanding on the risk than you know you going i'll oh, be a seven six seven regulation blah 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 blah, blah c2 potentially dangerous they don't really know where they stand with that kind of information yeah but if you could escalate that to say well actually if you look at electricity work regulation regulation did it that gives them a bit more of um, a stern understanding in the importance and value of what you're giving them all right um i think i mean paul, paul and i are going to do some work to try to create a good link between the fundamental principles of 7671 and the electricity work regulations because we want electricians to start thinking more about these regulations because they need to be a lot more active than those documents that i buy to pass my annual nic visit or that i saw once on a powerpoint presentation when i started college this legislation needs to be a lot more active in what we do every day if we can start using it better then clients will start hopefully listening and then that will make you stand out from those guys that will do you know loads of tests and not give a shit all right i'm gonna I'm going to go. I'm going to go and have a cup of tea. Uh, but message me if you want me to cover anything. We'll talk about any more of this in more detail. All right. Uh, have a good uh, Saturday. Uh, as I try to find out how to close this presentation. There we go. Um, and I will catch you in, when is the next one? I can't remember. Uh, check the website. Uh,